Please copy and distribute this book or video freely. Thank you. The Tabernacles I Get and Other Biology Revelations in the Bible Mystery of Mysteries Throughout the ages, many who have studied the various books of the Christian Bible have noticed something rather peculiar about the method in which said Bible was written. As one begins to read its chapters, curious patterns, codes, ciphers, secret messages, mathematical formulas, odd enigmas, etc., begin to materialize. Moreover, these strange and unusual anomalies appear to have been deliberately intertwined within the sacred texts for a reason that has yet to be revealed to the world. Perhaps you have noticed some of these anomalies as well. Let there be no doubt that a grand mystery of mysteries is lying there, just waiting for the right time to be uncovered and revealed to the world. In this presentation, we will attempt to unravel as much of this mystery as possible. This will be quite the challenge, as there is much to be revealed, and time is short. Are you ready? Adult Education I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. 1 Corinthians 3 2. When Paul tried to teach the Bible to others, he would occasionally encounter those that were not quite mature enough to handle certain truths. Paul used an interesting analogy to describe this phenomenon using milk and meat. Milk is what is fed to babies, while meat is what is fed to adults. One way to interpret the analogy is to say that milk represents the simpler teachings of the Bible, while meat would represent the more complex. Another way to interpret the analogy is to say that milk represents teachings in the Bible that are earthly, while meat represents teachings that are heavenly or spiritual. Still another way, and the way in which this presentation will teach, is that milk represents teachings that are appropriate for children. In other words, G, rated. Meat represents teachings that are appropriate for adults. In other words, NC-17 rated. A familiar example would be where babies come from. A child may be taught that babies come from a stork or that they grow on special baby trees. However, when the child grows up, they are eventually taught the truth. Sadly, the nursery rhyme interpretation of scripture is what is currently being taught to both children and adults. As a result, Christian adults have no idea in the world what the Word of God is ultimately trying to get across to everyone. This is a terrible situation that we are in. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 1 4. It could very well be that this grand deception is done on purpose by certain men who crept in unawares. These wicked men belong to a group that have a secret agenda. They have sworn oaths to keep the general population in a state of perpetual arrested development. The church being a prime target. Let us now wake up to their plans and contend for the faith. Because we will be dealing with adult themes, it is recommended that no children are present when watching and or reading this presentation. Be prepared for a course in adult education. The Body Temple What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? 1 Corinthians 6 19. A familiar teaching amongst Christians is how the body is the temple. If one were to view this from a child's perspective, they may conclude that this is merely a figure of speech and that one should not take it too literally. We could even generate silly memes to amuse ourselves. After all, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we do not see walls, pillars, windows, bricks, doors, a roof, etc. Therefore, it is difficult for the average person to imagine that this could be literal. We could try and view this as something mystical, but then we would be even further from achieving a precise literal understanding. Conversely, when we look at a temple, like the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness for example, 
we do not see a head, arms, torso, legs, feet, etc. We see a rather normal-looking tent-like structure with a fence surrounding it. To claim that this is literally a depiction of a human body would sound completely absurd to those that are still on the baby's milk. A good laugh could be had by all. Arrested development strikes again. To those that are ready to partake of the meat of the word, however, get ready to have your mind blown. Even those that have joined secret societies in order to become illuminated, so-called, will learn a thing or two. What doth life? But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 1.20 a perfect example of how certain men and women who crept in unawares in order to defile God's law would be those in favor of abortion. Doublespeak terms such as women's health and my body, my choice, are spread to the ignorant masses in attempts to obfuscate the real issue. Is abortion murder? If the public could be convinced that a human life begins at birth, then the issue would be solved. Abortion would therefore not be murder. An unborn baby could be terminated at any stage of development, from the moment of conception, to the moment before birth, and any time in between. The dream of corrupting the minds of everyone on the planet currently has a major stumbling block. That is of course the Christian Bible. Attempts have been made over the years to try and twist the word of God in such a way as to make abortion a non-biblical issue. Claims that God did not view unborn children as humans can be found all over the web. Thus, the commandment of thou shalt not kill would not apply. Thus, it is no wonder that those still on the milk of the word do not see a human body when looking at the tabernacle in the wilderness. They are still looking for a head, arms, and legs. If our bodies truly are a temple, then we must take this concept all the way back to the beginning where it all started. What doth life? There, that is better. The reason the tabernacle in the wilderness does not look like a human body is because the Christian is not taught that the tabernacle in the wilderness is in fact a scale model of the moment of conception. In other words, as I get, is this not a human? Is this not where life begins? Of course it is. This is the meat that is taken by the vultures, leaving the student of the word forever malnourished. We will now take a closer look at the tabernacle, beginning with the Hebrew name and spelling. The Mishkan. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Exodus 25 8-9. The Strong's Hebrew number for the tabernacle in the wilderness is 4908. The word is Mishkan. The Hebrew letters that make up the word Mishkan contain clues as to what the Mishkan was all about. The Hebrew language is very fascinating in that each individual letter tells a story. Thus, one can gain valuable insight about a Hebrew word just by studying its letters. Since Hebrew is read from right to left, we will start with the letter furthest to the right. This letter is called Mem. Mem is said to represent water, the womb of creation, pregnancy, and being submerged in water. Another way of putting it, Mem represents baptism with water. The next letter is called Shin. Shin is said to represent eternal fire, gnashing of teeth, a gate or a portal, and falsehood. If we put these clues together, we find that they match with the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the baptism with fire. The next letter is called calf. Calf is said to represent the laying of hands, bending to God's will, being filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, and a crown of glory. Calf gives life energy to matter and soul. Calf is a holy anointing. It is the electromagnetism within the spirit realm ready to manifest into the physical realm. Calf is quickening. Thus, calf would match with the concept of baptism with spirit. The final letter is called none. 
none is said to mean a sprouting seed, to propagate offspring, redemption, and becoming born again as a faithful servant. When we put all of this together, we discover that the word Mishkan literally means to experience the trinity of baptisms in order to become incarnated, that is to say, reincarnated, into this world, hopefully as a faithful servant of the Lord. Those wanting to learn more about the three baptisms should watch our Hell is a Parable for the Womb and Reincarnation video. A very important key to understanding the Bible's deepest mysteries is to come to the realization that reincarnation is absolutely, 100%, biblical. It was taught by Jesus himself and is a major theme throughout the Word of God. This is yet another example of how Christians are kept on the milk and even lied to, never to fully comprehend what hell and the lake of fire are all about. The concept of reincarnation will be taught openly as we progress in this presentation. Odds of Probability Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. John 2 19-21. As we have already learned, the temple represents the human body. A code has been embedded in these verses. Do you see it? Look at the number 40 and 6. What does this number have to do with the body temple? Our body temples are made up of 46 chromosomes. Chromosomes are the basic building blocks of life. Is this just a mere coincidence? Or did God leave this as a clue to look further into the sacred text? Oh, great! Here comes the doubting, unseeing, naive, contemptible, egomaniac, or dunce for short. Probably an atheist. The dunce claims that what we are noticing is simply a case of pareidolia. Pareidolia is the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on a nebulous stimulus, usually visual, so that one sees an object, pattern, or meaning where there is none. In other words, we are just imagining things. The dunce has concluded that we need to seek psychological help to correct our mental disorder. Imagine the most influential people in history being told that they were idiots and that their ideas were just plain dumb and would never work. This has happened many times to just about every influential person that ever lived. What if they listened to the dunce? Where would we be? If we were to listen to the dunce and stop here, how would we ever know if we were about to discover something truly remarkable? Unfortunately, what the dunce fails to understand is the concept of odds of probability. Odds of probability is a branch of mathematics that deals with how likely an event is to occur or how likely it is that a proposition is true. If we were to keep tossing a coin for example, we would find that the coin would land on either heads or tails approximately 50% of the time. However, if the coin landed on heads 100% of the time, we would conclude that this does not agree with normal odds of probability. As a result, we would know that there is something unusual happening. Keep this in mind as we go along. As we study the various verses in the Bible and compare them with science and biology, we will discover many correlations. So many in fact, that we will eventually reach a point in which these correlations cannot be explained by mere coincidence. We will discover that the odds of probability prove, once and for all, that highly advanced information was embedded into the Word of God thousands of years before their discovery. Temple Blueprints And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Exodus 25 8. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a tent-like structure designed to house the Ark of the Covenant. It also served as a place for the high priest to atone for sin. Its construction was modest and simple as it needed to be transported over long distances. The tabernacle in the wilderness was built by Moses and the Israelites after leaving Egypt during the Exodus. Over the years, the tabernacle would evolve into various permanent temples that were very magnificent in their appearance and build quality. Their layouts would all follow a similar pattern. The Ark of the Covenant, for example, 
would always be located in the section of the building called the Most Holy Place. The entrances of the temples would always face east. Many have postulated that the architecture of these buildings contain occult secrets. The pillars of Jachin and Boaz, for example, located at the entrance of King Solomon's temple, can be seen on the High Priestess Tarot card. Freemasonry artwork often depicts Jachin and Boaz in relation to heaven and earth, or the sun and moon. Why is this? It is because the mystery schools know that there truly are secrets encoded into these biblical temples. They generally keep this information to themselves, of course. The result is a population that is kept in a state of arrested development as we learned about earlier. Something that really stands out in the Bible is how incredibly detailed the descriptions of the various biblical temples are. God clearly has gone overboard with wanting us to know how every nut and bolt goes together. The tabernacle in the wilderness, for example, is described in such stunning detail that highly accurate scale models have been created using these Bible blueprints. It is no wonder that some occult mystery schools use the term grand architect. Note that Jesus was a carpenter by trade. There is a reason that God provided us with so much information. God is wishing for us to dig deeper here. Remember, the temple represents the human body at the moment of conception. We will now compare the tabernacle with the basic construction of a eukaryotic cell. The Tabernacle's Igot who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. Hebrews 8 5. The tabernacle in the wilderness was an earthly shadow of that which is in heaven. Consequently, for us to understand what is in heaven, we must look to the tabernacle for guidance. What you are looking at is a cross-section of a typical eukaryotic cell. This is the type of biological cell found in humans. This is how we start out, as a single-cell organism. It is the ovum at the moment of conception. A zygote. Many students have created models of biological cells in grade school as a science project. Therefore, the cell's basic construction should be easy enough for most to understand. Ah yes. Surprise, surprise. The dunce is already having issues and is trolling the students who wish to learn. He will no doubt be unable to complete his styrofoam and macaroni cell model. We will pray for him. Inside the cell we find that there are various components called organelles. As we can see, there are many different kinds. Each organelle serves a specific function and purpose within the cell. The model on the right lists many of the common organelles such as mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, nucleolus and so on. The tabernacle in the wilderness is built in a similar manner. It too has various organelles, that is to say, components and furniture. These serve specific functions and purposes within the sacred temples. Here is where things get rather mind-blowing. When one begins to compare the functions and descriptions of each cell organelle to the components of the tabernacle, we find that they are an exact match. Remember what we covered earlier in this presentation about odds of probability. We are about to discover that the odds of this happening is virtually impossible. That is, unless a highly advanced being encoded this information long ago. Tabernacle Layout here is what the overall layout of the tabernacle in the wilderness looks like. It is basically a tent-like structure surrounded by a fence. The main entrance always faces east. Just inside the main entrance is the brazen altar. Past the brazen altar is the laver of water. Inside the tent-like structure is the table of shewbread on the north, the candlestick on the south, and the altar of incense in the center. The Ark of the Testimony is furthest away on the west end. We will begin on the inside of the tent-like structure, in a section called the Holy Place. This is where the candlestick, the altar of incense and the table of shewbread reside. We will eventually work our way outside where the brazen altar and laver of water are. 
Golgi apparatus versus table of shewbread. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. Leviticus 24 5 6. Upon first entering the holy place, on the right hand side, stood the table of shewbread. On top of the table were stacks of bread resembling pitas or perhaps pancakes. What are the odds that biology textbooks would describe a cell organelle using the exact same description? The complex was discovered by Camillo Golgi in 1898. It is made of several flattened sac-like membranes which look like a stack of pancakes. Simple English Wikipedia. Look how easy that was. No tricks were used to try and find some obscure description from some long-forgotten reference. This is a common teaching that every biologist knows. The Golgi apparatus resembles a stack of pancakes. The table of shewbread has stacks of pancakes on it. God has made it so obvious for us, we barely have to think in order to see that they are a perfect match. It does not end there, however. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Leviticus 24 7. On top of the bread was a special spice called frankincense that was often burned to produce a perfume smell. The frankincense was to later become an offering made by fire, which was burned on the brazen altar. So, what does the frankincense ultimately symbolize in the Bible? And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Revelation 8 4. The smoke of the frankincense represents prayers to God. Note that these prayers are delivered by the hand of the angel. In a way, the angel is acting as the postman, delivering letters to God. In a similar manner, the Golgi apparatus is often described as the post office of the cell. Proteins are packaged and sent out like letters to their respective addresses. The frankincense therefore is a perfect match for these proteins, each one containing a special prayer or letter to God. Whenever God receives one of these letters, it produces a soothing effect. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Psalms 141-2 Amen. Cell signaling versus altar of incense. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. Exodus 31. At the center of the holy place, next to the table of shewbread, stood the altar of incense. This is the altar we just learned about that offered prayers to God. Only those that were authorized by God were allowed to burn incense on it. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God, and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. 2 Chronicles 26 16. King Isaiah was a prosperous king that did many things right in the eyes of God. Sadly, the king's ego got the better of him. One day the king decided to burn incense on the altar of incense. God punished him by causing a leprous sore to break out on his forehead. Here we see a disease occurring when a specific process in the cell is not done according to the way God designed it. Leprosy is a disease that can lead to damage of the nervous system and respiratory tract. Since incense is something that is inhaled, perhaps there is a connection between the altar of incense and maintaining the overall health of the lungs and the spirit. Since we know that the altar of incense is important for sending communications to God, we can see how the altar of incense would aid in the process of cell communication. In biology, cell signaling or cell communication is the ability of a cell to receive, process, and transmit signals with its environment and with itself. Think of how our nervous system acts as a network for bodily communications. If something is disrupted, huge problems can occur. The same can happen within the cell. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, 
that he die not. Leviticus 16:13. Cancer is an example of how a disruption in cell signaling could lead to harm. Look at how the incense is vital to keeping the high priest alive. The mercy seat is another place cell communications takes place. Who else died with regards to improper handling of the sacred incense? And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Leviticus 10.1. Nadab and Abihu are another example of how not following incense protocol leads to death. Something was not communicated properly, and as a result a fire devoured them instantly. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. Numbers 1646. During the rebellion of Korah, many of the rebels died. God sent a plague among those that blamed Moses for the deaths of the rebels. Aaron used incense to stop the plague. This is a great picture of how incense communication goes outside of the tabernacle cell to quickly stop disease from spreading to the rest of the body. Aaron and the incense stood between the dead and the alive. This acted like a barrier, preventing the plague from passing. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee, shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. 1 Kings 13 2. When Israel split into the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, the northern king, King Jeroboam, built a false place of worship to burn incense. This was done so that the Israelites would go to the false altar instead of the actual temple in Jerusalem. This of course angered God who sent a special man of God to deal with the situation. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. 1 Kings 13.4 the man of God had interrupted King Jeroboam before he could burn the incense. The enraged King Jeroboam then motioned with his hand to see as the man of God. It was at that moment that Jeroboam's hand dried up. An injury had just occurred. Can the king's hand be healed? A communication to God is sent. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. 1 Kings 13 6. Again, we see how prayer and incense are connected. Jeroboam asks the man of God to pray. A communication is sent to God. Signals are directed to their proper locations, and King Jeroboam's hand is restored. In this case, the false altar of incense was destroyed. Perhaps it is a picture of a cancerous cell being eliminated from the body. There is another interesting clue in 1 Kings 13 too. Men's bones were prophesied to burn on the altar one day in place of the incense. This is a very important piece of evidence as to what the altar of incense means in terms of cell biology. As we all know, bones have an abundance of calcium in them. Scripture goes out of its way to connect calcium with bones. And as we will soon see, calcium is connected to the altar of incense as well. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Matthew 23:27. See how the word, bones, is connected to the word, whited? The whitewash used to coat the sepulchers is plaster. The main ingredient in plaster is calcium. Another word for calcium in the Bible is lime. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, 
because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Amos 2 1. Do you see the pattern developing? Bones and calcium are linked yet again. The word lime is still used to this day to describe calcium deposits. Here we see what happens when the bones are burned on the altar of incense. They turn into calcium. What is God teaching us? Let us keep looking for answers. By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin, when he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalkstones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and images shall not stand up. Isaiah 27 9. We have yet another fascinating connection between calcium and the altar of incense. Chalkstones is another word for calcium. Our odds of probability are increasing. What about the frankincense itself? There is a lot of controversy as to where the word came from. Perhaps we can help. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down, and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Matthew 2.11. The Greek word for frankincense comes from the original Hebrew word, Labana. It is Strong's Hebrew number 3828. The origin of the word Labana is Laban, which means white, or to be white. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Genesis 49.12. Do we need to point out the obvious connection between milk, teeth and calcium? There are some who argue that frankincense comes from an ancient word for milk. In Chinese, frankincense literally means fragrant milk. What else is frankincense related to? The people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick. Isaiah 65 3. Frankincense in Hebrew is also related to the word brick. Calcium lime is an essential ingredient for making bricks. Look how the altar of incense is once again related to calcium. What else can we find? Moreover the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. Isaiah 30 26. The biblical word for moon, Labana, is related to frankincense as well. And yes, one of the major elements the moon is made of is calcium. See the word healing? And if the priest shall come in, and look upon it, and, behold, the plague hath not spread in the house, after the house was plastered. Then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the plague is healed. Leviticus 14.48. Here we have another plague that is healed as it relates to calcium plaster. Note that plaster is still used to this day to heal broken bones. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Daniel 5 5. Belshazzar was another wicked king who used silverware from the temple to host a big feast. Bad idea. A communication from God is sent via the calcium plaster wall. The calcium pattern is becoming clearer. There is something about calcium and communication from God that is important here. Thou shalt set thee up great stones, and plaster them with plaster. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law. Deuteronomy 27 2-3. When the Israelites were to enter the promised land, they were to immediately make an altar with calcium plastered stones. They were to write God's communication onto the calcium. Are you seeing the pattern yet? Hold on Mr. Dunce. We are almost there. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Revelation 9.13. Now we are getting somewhere. What a strange thing for God to be teaching us. A voice is coming from the four horns of the altar of incense in heaven. The evidence is piling up that the altar of incense represents cell communications. But what does all of this have to do with calcium? One more verse should do it. 
And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Luke 1 11. In this famous verse, the angel Gabriel stands next to the altar of incense to deliver an important message. The prayers of Zacharias were heard. Again, we see how the altar of incense is a method for prayers to reach God. Angels are messengers. And now we have the final piece of the puzzle. Calcium ions are a key element in cell signaling. Said calcium ions are even called messengers. Time and time again, the Word of God is pointing us to calcium as a means by which cell communications takes place. Of course, there are many other elements and methods by which cell signaling takes place. So, why is God having us focus on this particular method? The answer may be found in the smoke of the altar of incense. Obviously, incense is very sweet-smelling. That is the point. God is using incense as a unique and special way of teaching us about cell communications. It turns out that calcium plays a central role in olfactory signaling, in other words, our sense of smell. Additionally, calcium signaling is a dynamic process in our sense of taste. It is no wonder frankincense was added to food offerings burned on the altar and he shall take of it his handful, of the flour of the meat offering, and of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering, and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor, even the memorial of it, unto the Lord. Leviticus 6:15. The high priest and his sons ate a portion of this offering. Thus, taste and smell are an important theme here. Part of the calcium signaling process involves a component called G-protein coupled receptors. Another name for this component is called 7-pass transmembrane receptors. The number 7 is of course significant here, however did you catch the way in which some scientific diagrams draw this component? They use a serpent. Obviously, there is much to discover in this area of research. Cell signaling is life. These receptors are so important that approximately half of all prescription drugs are targeted to this group of plasma membrane receptors. Perhaps a cure to many diseases is encoded in the sacred text waiting to be found. Could you be the one to unlock these secrets? Mitochondrial DNA versus Candlestick And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops and his flowers shall be of the same. Exodus 25:31. On the left-hand side of the holy place stood the temple menorah or candlestick. With its seven lamps, this is one of the most fascinating and beloved objects in the temple. The emblem of Israel features a candlestick with olive branches on either side. These can represent the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Revelation 11:4. Note that the olive trees are synonymous with candlesticks. This is a very important clue as to what these symbols are all about. The way the two are related has to do with DNA and genetics. The more we learn about the construction of the candlestick, the more we will understand how all this works. Thankfully, God has given us detailed instructions to build one. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Exodus 25 32. We begin constructing the candlestick using our Bible as the blueprint. Three branches on each side makes a total of six branches. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. Exodus 25 33. Each branch has three buds on it. Each bud has a knop, bowl and flower. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knops and their flowers. Exodus 25 34. The center shaft of the candlestick has an additional four more buds. Each bud has the same knop, bowl and flower. 
Note that the buds on the ends of all the branches act as a lamp for a total of seven lamps. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof. And they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Exodus 25 37. And there we have it. The candlestick reconstructed from scripture. God really went out of his way to describe every detail. Why is this? Was the candlestick just some cute decoration meant to give light? Or was there more to it? Were the seven lamps just a random number that looked nice? Or are the seven lamps meant to convey a special message that only a future generation would be able to recognize? The numbers and shapes indeed reveal a great mystery to those wise enough to understand. If we count the number of buds, we find that there are 22 of them. This is our first clue as to what the candlestick represents. The number 22 is very special indeed. Throughout known life, there are 22 genetically encoded amino acids, 20 in the standard genetic code, and an additional two that can be incorporated by special translation mechanisms. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The Hebrew alphabet contains 22 letters. Right away we can see that the candlestick is related to the Word of God. Many researchers over the years have noticed that the number of Hebrew letters match genetics in some way or another. Here is an example from an independent researcher. We see how the Hebrew alphabet matches with all the genetically encoded amino acids said to exist. How about another witness? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119-105. In this amazing verse we find that the lamp indeed represents the word of God. As we move along in this presentation, we will discover that the word was made flesh. The links between the word of God and genetics will be made very clear. Notice that this particular verse is special in that it has a Hebrew letter associated with it. The letter is none. Remember what we learned earlier about none? None is all about a seed that is sprouting, life generating. It is highly genetic in nature. The evidence is beginning to add up as to what cell organelle the candlestick relates to. What about the components that make up the buds? We learned that there is a knot, a bowl, and a flower in each. In other words, there are three parts. If we multiply the number of parts times the number of buds, we find that the number of parts is 66. Many of you should recognize the significance of that number. Yes, it is the total number of books in the Bible. Once again, we find that the candlestick represents the Word of God. There are so many more clues we can look at, but we will just go ahead and state the obvious. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1:14. The Word of God becoming flesh is a perfect picture of how RNA and DNA forms life. We will be going over what RNA and DNA is in a moment. For now, just know that the candlestick is a perfect representation of DNA. Another mystery revealed. So, what organelle fits best with everything we have learned so far? There are two main organelles that we will be examining in this study that contain DNA. They are nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Which organelle do you suppose the candlestick best represents? In order to correctly identify the organelle that matches, we need a bit more information. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation 4-5. Excellent. The seven lamps of the candlestick represent the Holy Spirit of God. What else can we find? But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 1-8. Indeed. The Holy Ghost represents power. Thus, the candlestick also represents the power of the Holy Spirit. Now all we must do is find the cell organelle that matches with these descriptions. 
In other words, which organelle is the powerhouse of the cell? Here are some interesting memes that can be found on the internet. What do you think? Did God make it obvious for us? Although some students may claim they learned nothing in school, we know better. They learned that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. We have the proof. Yes, the candlestick represents mitochondria, or more specifically, mitochondrial DNA. And, in a most remarkable, and perhaps even supernatural way, the very shape of the candlestick reveals a mystery that has been hidden in plain sight for thousands of years. Most reconstructions of the temple menorah are created with circular branches. Obviously, nature does not create branches with perfect arch shapes to them. This was a special design element that was inspired long ago. The carving shown is from the time when the Romans conquered Jerusalem in AD 70. So, why did God have the temple builders create a representation of DNA that is circular? It is because mitochondrial DNA is circular, of course. This is too easy. The mysteries of God are being revealed right before our very eyes with little effort. Hallelujah. Let us not forget the crown of thorns placed on the head of Jesus. Yes. The crown of thorns is a representation of mitochondrial DNA. The Bible even describes the crown of thorns being woven in a helical fashion. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. John 19:2. The word plaited literally means to twist into a helical shape. Note that mitochondrial DNA is passed down from the mother. It is a feminine symbol. Ouch! The dunce appears to be having an existential crisis. Too bad the dunce chose the wrong path in life. Is there hope? We shall see. RNA and DNA versus the Word of God. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Exodus 31:18. Before we move on to the next cell organelle, we should pause to go over some of the basics of what RNA and DNA is. After this, we will be able to see how everything relates to the Word of God. The two tables of testimony that Moses received on Mount Sinai, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments, were written on the front and back of the tablets. This means that there were four pages total. Each of the four pages were written by the finger of God. Note that the front page and back page are joined to one another. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord, and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Isaiah 34 16. The pages are mated as one. They are like a couple that are married together. Think of the marriage supper of the Lamb. In a similar way, the Word of God that writes the DNA code of all life are married as well. DNA is made of four nitrogenous bases. Adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. Adenine is married to thymine. Cytosine is married to guanine. This is called pair bonding. None shall want her mate. It is always this way. DNA generally comes in a helical shape as seen in this diagram. It is like two twisting serpents that have been fused together with rungs in between them. If we were to untwist and flatten this shape, DNA would resemble a ladder. Interestingly, there is only one verse in the King James Bible that uses the word ladder. And he dreamed, and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Genesis 28:12. Many have speculated as to what Jacob's ladder represents in the Bible. Long story short, Jacob's ladder represents DNA. How do we know this? Just read the next verse. And, behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Genesis 28:13. The word seed in the Bible is synonymous with DNA and genetics. 
Jacob's ladder represents Abraham's seed, which is a metaphor for the future glorified body that the saved will inherit one day. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Luke 8 11. The word seed in the Bible has a special meaning. It refers to genetics such as plant genetics, beast genetics and human genetics. Next verse please. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in the end in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 28 14. Let there be no doubt. Following the context of scripture is the best way to reveal its deepest mysteries. Note the phrase dust of the earth. The dust of the earth is another metaphor for genetics. Adam was made from the dust of the earth. Not rocks and dead things. Adam was made from living stones. Jacob even used stones for pillows, indicating that stones are related to genetics as well. What else can we find about Jacob and DNA? Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 41 14. Wait, what? Did God just call Jacob a worm? Why yes, yes, he did. Why? The answer was already given. The worm is another word for serpent in the Bible. The serpent represents a single strand of DNA called RNA. God called Jacob a worm because Jacob represents genetics and Abraham's seed. See how everything is connected? I have said to corruption, thou art my father. To the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. Job 17 14. Was Job being literal? Was his mother and sister really worms? If we understand worm to be genetics, then the answer is yes. Job is related genetically via the worm RNA genome. See how the code works? The Bible is meant to be interpreted by the kingdom of God within. What about the serpent on a pole? And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Numbers 21.9 the serpent on a pole has become ubiquitous as the symbol for medicine. God has done an excellent job of reminding us where our corruption comes from. It comes from our serpent on a pole. In other words, our RNA. When Jesus said ye are of your father the devil, he was being literal. Is this too much? The serpent on a pole is also called the rod of Asclepius. Where was this worshipped? I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipa was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Revelation 2.13. This verse is referring to Pergamon, where the temple of Asclepius was. It is where they worshipped the rod of Asclepius, the symbol for RNA. Thus, the seed of Satan is in mankind's very RNA and DNA. God turned Satan into the serpent in the Garden of Eden, remember? What was this serpent that ate the dust of the ground genetics? What did the serpent truly represent? We call it sperm. That is what the seed of the serpent is. Remember what we learned at the beginning of this presentation about the meat of the word? The wool that has been pulled over the eyes of Christians for centuries has blinded them to the most profound of wisdom. The devil is the father of earthly genetics. The Bible itself is all about genetics. It tells the story of how it became corrupted by the forbidden fruit of them, fertilized by Satan. The Bible also tells the story of how this corrupted seed would be corrected one day. This leads us to Jesus on the cross whose crucifixion is likened to the serpent on a pole. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must a son of man be lifted up. John 3:14. Incredible, is it not? Jesus is the word of God. The blood of Jesus will take away the sins of the world. It is the genetic template by which mankind must be upgraded with. The seed of Abraham. The living stone the rock and chief cornerstone that the genetic engineers rejected. His death on the cross was a picture of Satan's corrupt genetics finally being defeated. 
that is finished. Amen. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Galatians 3.16. In this revealing verse, we discover that Abraham's seed is Jesus. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Genesis 28.22. After Jacob had the dream of the latter, the stone that he used as a pillow was anointed. He then said it would be God's house. Jesus is that rock and chief cornerstone nucleo base that will wash us clean. So, now that we have had a brief study on RNA and DNA in the Bible, we can go back to the candlestick and put the final pieces of the puzzle together. Remember how it has 22 buds representing amino acids in the Hebrew alphabet? Watch what happens when we overlay Jacob's DNA ladder over the candlestick. Keep in mind the odds of probability. What are the odds that there will be a perfect match between the two? DNA Composition versus Candlestick For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. 2 Samuel 22:29. So far, we have been looking at simplified graphics depicting DNA. In reality, DNA is a bit more complex than what we are seeing here. Using the candlestick as our guide, we will be able to accurately reconstruct what DNA actually consists of. Here we have two branches of the candlestick. One branch on the left and one branch on the right. Both branches combined gives us a single rung on the DNA ladder. In between the branches, there is a bud. That is where the two branches connect to each other. In DNA, this would be something called a hydrogen bond. The center hydrogen bonds form the shaft of the candlestick. Working our way outward, we find that connected to the center hydrogen bond is our nitrogenous bases. This would be the word of God in our DNA. Connected to the nitrogenous bases, we have a sweet substance called a pentose sugar. A more technical name would be deoxyribose. Think of how the word honey is used in the Bible to describe the word of God. How sweet are thy words unto my taste! Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalms 119-103. The word of God is sweet because it is attached to a yummy pentis sugar. Sometimes, however, the sweet word of God can make the belly bitter. We must be ready to handle the meat of the word. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Revelation 10:10. 10, 10. When we learn about the final component of DNA, it may leave some with a bitter stomach. Be brave as we continue. Connected to the deoxyribose pentose sugar is phosphorus. Yikes. No wonder John had an upset stomach. And as any chemist would know, phosphorus is extremely flammable, hence the flaming lamps. But of course, this is a no-brainer. Another no-brainer is what the word phosphorus means in the Bible. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14 12. Phosphorus is the light bearer Lucifer. Phosphorus is used to make matches. Is God trying to tell us something here? You bet. We already learned that the serpent is related to DNA and RNA in many ways. One could spend years connecting these dots. Speaking of no-brainers, is the dunce beginning to see the light? Perhaps the dunce is finally ready to receive some serpent wisdom. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Matthew 10:16. It is the Lucifer strands of phosphorus that form the typical serpents we see in all DNA and RNA diagrams. Yet, the lamps are representative of the Holy Ghost. There is much to meditate on here. These are hardcore truths to receive. The more one seeks, the more one finds. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, 
whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. 2 Peter 1 19. The Greek word for day star is phosphorus. Can you believe it? Look at what this verse is teaching. A light that shines in a dark place. A candlestick. What is this phosphorus light? It is a more sure word of prophecy. It is the word of God in our genetics. It is not open to private interpretation. It says what it means and means what it says. It is the two witnesses in the heart of the earth. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12:40. What is the heart of the earth? Is it a place of infinite torments? No. The heart of the earth is the most holy place of the tabernacles I get. It is where Jesus went to sprinkle the blood. We are almost ready to boldly enter it, but first let us do a final review of the completed candlestick. Here is the final overlay. The components that make up DNA match precisely with the components of the candlestick. We even have an added bonus. The overall layout reveals yet another great mystery. The three rungs of the DNA ladder form what is called a codon. What is so special about a codon? Codons are what every amino acid is made of. The 22 buds represent the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet word of God forming codons. Note that thymine replaces uracil in DNA. How about one more mystery revealed regarding codons in the Bible? Warning. Use extreme caution with the information you are about to be presented with. You are going to learn something that only a handful of people on the planet know about. Because the book of Revelation prophecies are beginning to manifest, we felt it was appropriate to include the following material. In Kabbalah, there is something called the Shem Hemepharash. The Shem Hemepharash is said to be a top-secret name of God called the Explicit Name. It is related to the lost word in Freemasonry. Since the explicit name is a mystery, various methods and practices have been introduced to help the initiate recover it. An example of one of those methods, shown here, uses triads of letters which are acquired from specific verses in the Bible. What this initiate may not have realized is that they have in fact discovered codons. Perhaps they were even led by a spirit to include a spiral representation of said codons that resemble an RNA helix viewed down its center axis. But why on earth would God embed codons in the Bible? Stay tuned to find out. Nucleus versus the Most Holy Place. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Exodus 25 22. While the table of shewbread, candlestick, and altar of incense resided in the holy place of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant resided in the Most Holy Place. The Most Holy Place is where the High Priest would enter to receive instructions from God. From above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, communication would take place. One could say that the Most Holy Place was the command center of the temple. Where have we heard that before? The nucleus serves as the cell's command center, sending directions to the cell to grow, mature, divide, or die. Medline plus. Once again, God makes this easy to understand. Just like the most holy place serves as the command center of the temples, so too does the nucleus of the cell. There is even a special separating component to provide specific boundaries. In the temple, the component separating the holy place from the most holy place is called the veil. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Hebrews 10 19-20. Notice what is being said here. The veil represented the flesh of Jesus. This is one of many examples in the Bible of how a literal interpretation reveals the most information. 
we, as Bible students, are to understand Bible temples as the literal flesh of Jesus. In the cell, the component that separates the nucleus command center from the rest of the cell is called the nuclear envelope. This would be our next match. The temple veil is synonymous with the nuclear envelope. The function of the nuclear envelope is to enclose the genetic material that resides inside the nucleus. This is the same veil that was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Mark 15 37 to 38. The significance of this event is very profound and will be explored later in the presentation. Nucleolus versus the Ark of the Covenant. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Exodus 25:10. As we just learned, the most holy place of the temple is the command center. The tabernacle component by which said commands originate from is called the Ark of the Testimony. It is also called the Ark of the Covenant. It is here that communications with God takes place. Since there is only one major cell organelle inside the nucleus command center, we can, by process of elimination, conclude that the Ark of the Testimony would match with the organelle called the nucleolus. This is perhaps the easiest one to identify. The nucleolus is considered the birthplace of ribosomes, the tiny machines that make proteins. Since we will be covering only the basics in this study, we will keep things as simple as possible. Just know that ribosomes make proteins using a process called translation. What does translation have to do with God's command center? By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Hebrews 11:5. In this amazing passage, we find that Enoch went to heaven, without dying, by a process called translation. Think of how unusual and supernatural that process was. Now imagine a similar process by which a new life begins at the moment of conception. An extraordinary supernatural translation is taking place. Notice the word testimony. The arc of the testimony is where translation happens. It is a very special place in which the word of God grows and multiplies. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 12 24. Indeed, the nucleus of the cell is where the word of God, DNA and RNA, grows and multiplies. Of course, we still need to verify that what we are seeing is truly what God wishes for us to understand. We will now go over the ark in more detail and compare it to the nucleolus of the cell. The ark of the testimony is made of three parts. The chest is the large box on the bottom that contains some very special items. On top of the chest is a type of lid called the mercy seat. On top of the mercy seat are the two cherubim that face each other. There appears to be another part however, referred to as the footstool of our God. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God, and had made ready for the building. 1 Chronicles 28-2 it is not clear whether the footstool is the mercy seat itself or a separate part altogether. What is clear, however, is that the footstool plays an important role in helping us decipher the mysteries of the sacred temples. We will come back to this shortly, but first we must go over the contents that are inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. Hebrews 9 4. Three items may be found inside the ark. The golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. We will first study Aaron's rod that budded. RNA and DNA versus Aaron's rod that budded. 
And it came to pass, that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and, behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. Numbers 17 8. Aaron's rod that budded was placed inside of the ark. There is a very important reason for this. Rods in the Bible are a fascinating topic. As we dive deeper into the genetic code of scripture, we will find that rods will reveal much. Earlier we learned that the branches of the candlestick has almond blossoms on them. The fact that Aaron's rod also has almond blossoms shows us that the two are related. Since we now know that the candlestick represents DNA, we can use that information to decode the meaning of Aaron's rod as it pertains to human genetics. We begin with the first use of the word rod in the King James Bible. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar, and of the hazel and chestnut tree, and pilled white strakes in them, and made the white appear which was in the rods. Genesis 30 37. Well look who we have here. If it isn't our good friend Jacob, the worm, who represents RNA, DNA and the genetics of the glorified body. Jacob was later renamed to Israel. What the heck is he doing with those rods? He is carving strakes in them. Look closely at that 1665 painting. Notice the candy cane pattern? The candy cane stripes are the strakes that twist around the rod like a serpent on a pole. Do you see it? This photo shows strakes on a rod used to reduce vibrations on a pipe. Jacob's rods may have looked similar. Of course, it should be obvious by now as to what the helical shape represents. Yes. DNA. But wait. Are we just imagining things here? How do we really know that the rods represent seat and the worm? Once again, we will use context to decipher the code. Next verse please. And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs, when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. Genesis 30 38. And there we have it. Jacob's serpent on a pole via straked rods represent conception. Incredible. What about the rod that Moses had? And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Exodus 4 2-3. What is this? A rod becoming a serpent? Did not the duns tell us that we needed to seek professional help for imagining there is some sort of connection between the two? Yet, there it is for all to see. And what about Aaron's rod? Did that become a serpent as well? When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Shew a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Exodus 7 9. Yep. Aaron's rod became a serpent as well, although it is not clear whether it is the same rod that budded. However, one thing is clear. Rods, serpents, genetics and conception are all related to one another. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah 11 1. This is a very famous verse foretelling the genetic line of Jesus. There are plenty more examples, but you get the idea. We are now ready for the next item inside the ark. Pentus sugar versus golden pot of manna. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Exodus 16:31. The manna was the food that the Israelites ate when they wandered through the wilderness. It was bread that came from heaven. Notice its ingredients. It is made of carbohydrate wafers and sugar. Previously, we learned that one of the basic building blocks of DNA and RNA is the pentis sugar. This sugar makes the word of God sweet as honey. The golden pot of manna and the pentis sugar are a perfect match for each other. Is not this amazing? Of course, since we are talking about genetics and flesh here, we should have no trouble finding relating verses. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John 6 51. The bread that came from heaven, the golden pot of manna, represents the flesh of Jesus. Note that the flesh Jesus had would ultimately die on the cross. Our flesh too is subject to death. There is, however, a special glorified manna that will never die. It will be given to those that overcome. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Revelation 2.17. We will go over the book of Revelation and how it relates to genetics soon. For now, just know that the white stone is another name for Abraham's seed. The new name is a new genetic sequence that will be written on it that will take away the sins of the world. Nitrogenous Bases versus Word of God Forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. The final item inside the ark are the two tables of the testimony. This verse really gets to the heart of the matter. The New Testament is revealing what the tables of testimony were really all about. The two tables of testimony are representative of what is to be written in the tables of the heart. Literally. We are talking about human genetics here. There will come a day when the human genome will be rewritten and ultimately corrected of all errors and flaws. This will be written by the finger of God, and not by man, in the heart of the earth. It happens in the most holy place of the body temple. Since we have already gone over the verses dealing with how the Word of God represents nitrogenous bases, we can conclude that the two tables of the testimony inside the ark represent adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. And as a double witness, we can overlay the ark items with the candlestick to see if they match. On the left we have our previous study of how we overlaid the components that make up DNA on top of the candlestick for a perfect match. On the right, we have overlaid the arc items on top of the candlestick. Looks like we have another perfect match yet again. The tables of the testimony fit where the nitrogenous bases go. The golden pot of manna fits where the pentis sugar goes. And finally, the serpent rod of Aaron fits where the serpent strands of Lucifer phosphorus goes. The angel of light. But hold on a moment. It would appear we are missing the center hydrogen bonds. Where could this cloudy gas be hiding? Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40:34. Tud ah. Hydrogen is a gas. Think of the hydrogen clouds in space nebulas. Hydrogen is also the main chemical element in H2O, otherwise known as water. Clouds are of course filled with water vapor. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Genesis 9.13. Our sun is mostly hydrogen, whose light creates a colorful rainbow in the clouds. The rainbow is a covenant, which reminds us of the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus is the light of the world and is likened to our sun, made mostly of hydrogen. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Luke 21 27. For those that really want to get technical in their learning, we can add electromagnetism to the equation. The word power in the Bible is the same word we use for electromagnetism. The center hydrogen bonds that hold the branches of the candlestick DNA together is primarily an electrostatic force of attraction. Think of an electron cloud. It is the life force energy that quickens the Word and makes the Word of God DNA come alive. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. Revelation 1-7. In our Ezekiel's Atomic Wheels and Four Living Forces presentation, we learned that the word I in the Bible is code for the electron. Jesus comes with electron clouds. 
that is a cloud of witnesses. The Spirit of God was in the wheels. We can now add this final element to the candlestick. The rainbow in the cloud. The electromagnetic power that bridges everything together. Let this serve as a double witness to the fact that the most intimate details of DNA has been encoded into the Bible long before their so-called discovery. Amen. Art Cherubim vs. Genetics Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Ezekiel 28:14. We are about to cover an extremely sobering subject. This will be very difficult for some to receive. The verse is directed at the king of Tyrus, one of the biblical antichrists. Yet, at the same time, it is directed at Satan. God is teaching us that Satan represents the cherubim that cover the ark. Since we already know that the ark represents the flesh of Jesus, we can already see where this is heading. Do not worry, however. We have a verse that covers this uncomfortable truth. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Romans 8:3. Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, Jesus was made in the likeness of you and me. Therefore, the tabernacle and temples in the Bible must somehow reflect our earthly biology. Remember, the actual temple is in heaven. Moses was instructed to make an earthly shadow. A facsimile. Let us begin with the word, covereth. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. Exodus 25:20. The word covereth, covering, cover, etc. is Hebrew Strong's number. 5526. This word can be found 24 times in the Old Testament. What exactly does God mean when he uses this word? Since we now know that the Ark of the Covenant represents the place in the cell where the magic of DNA helps create a life form, perhaps this word is related to this process. One definition of this word is to weave or knit together. The King James Bible translates this word as fenced. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Job 10:11. Notice the context in which the word fenced is used. Job is describing how he was created in the womb. God fenced or knit together Job from a zygote. As a side note, we should mention that this is what God meant when he clothed Adam and Eve. God reincarnated the couple after they died from partaking of the forbidden fruit. Do you see how the word of God fits together so nicely? For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Psalms 139.13. Look how obvious this all is. Once again, the word cover has the meaning of something that happens after the moment of conception in the heart of the earth, in the womb, in the most holy place of the tabernacles I get. How about another? Or who shut up the sea with doors, when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb? Job 38.8. The phrase, shut up, is the same word for cover. It is being used in comparison to water breaking from a womb. And, as you should know by now, the Bible describes earth as our current mother. No, this is not pagan teachings. Mother Earth is Mystery Babylon. Clearly the word cover if used to describe the function of the cherubim have much to do with biology and childbirth. What about those stones of fire? The stones of fire are what make up the outer serpent strands of RNA and DNA. Lucifer. Phosphorus. The light bearer. Satan walked up and down in the midst of them. Satan ascended and descended on the ladder of DNA. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11:14. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We are seeing how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil works. Satan's genetics were passed on to the human race. God is trying to teach us this. Is this hard to believe? Let us hear it from God. 
Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. John 8 44. Although this verse is directed at the Jews, it applies to all of mankind in the most literal of meanings. You see it for yourself now. Again, our genetics originally came from Satan period. We are not evolved from apes. We have more proof. Thou hast been an eat in the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Ezekiel 28:13. In this very revealing verse, we discover that Satan, while in the Garden of Eden, had a special covering. You know what that means now. It is the type of body that a soul and spirit have. Satan's was unique in that he had either nine or ten nitrogenous bases as opposed to our four. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Genesis 3 1. As we can see in this verse, Satan was created to be the most subtle beast of them all. There was a special workmanship that went into creating Satan. So much so that Satan, as a beast, was able to speak with knowledge. It could very well be that this knowledge was built into Satan's very DNA. Satan was also originally created with tabrets and pipes. These are musical instruments. Since Satan was a bird-like cherubim, perhaps the tabrets and pipes were a reference to the musical sounds that the fowls of the air would make. Some birds of course can mimic human speech. Thus, Satan's tabrets and pipes could have been finely crafted to produce eloquent discourse. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Genesis 3:22. After the fall in the garden, Adam and Eve received a new covering of sinful flesh, based on the genetics of Satan. Humans, and perhaps all life, was dumbed down to the four nitrogenous bases we have now. And when we say dumbed down, we mean it. The human race is now desperately attempting to add those lost words back into Earth's genetics. A new gospel added to the Word of God. In recent years, genetic engineers have created brand new, never before seen, nucleobases. Researchers at Scripps Research Institute added two more letters to the existing four, bringing the total to six. Some call them alien life forms. How much longer will it be before they are able to recreate all the precious gemstones in Satan's DNA? High Priest And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Exodus 28:2. An important aspect of the tabernacles and temples of the Bible was the high priest. Throughout the year, the high priest would wear special garments that were very colorful. These were always worn when performing duties. As we can see in this verse, one of the main purposes of this garment was for beauty. Why is that? There is only one other verse in the Bible that uses the Hebrew words for garment and beauty together at the same time. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Isaiah 52 1. These words are used to describe the heavenly new Jerusalem that will put on beautiful garments. A very noticeable part of the high priest garments was something called the breastplate of judgment, made up of many beautiful gemstones. The foundation of New Jerusalem is also made of beautiful gemstones. Thus, the high priest garments and New Jerusalem are a perfect match. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians 4:26. Did you know that you had a new mom waiting for you in heaven? Well, now you do. 
Now, it is important to mention here that the term mother needs to be understood in a specific way. Technically, it is the new earth that is the mother, while New Jerusalem is her womb. In other words, New Jerusalem is our mother in the sense that the saved will be born again from within her pearly gates. In previous presentations, we studied New Jerusalem in detail and how it represents the womb of Sarah. The tree of life represents ovary. The fruit produced on a monthly period was representative of a woman's menstrual cycle. The river flowing from the throne and the lamb are what fertilizes the eggs on the tree of life. The saved partake of the fruit and are conceived into the glorified body. This is the opposite of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, with mystery Babylon as the earth mother. Of course, since the tabernacles and temples are representations of the female egg cell, it is no surprise that the Bible portrays the high priest as an extension of this femininity. And now that you are becoming familiar with the meat of the word, you should be able to recognize the adult education that is before you. Only the circumcised phallus shall enter the womb of New Jerusalem to fertilize her ovum fruit on the tree of life. Do you see it now? There it is in plain sight. The Bible is jam-packed with double entendre. Thus, the high priest ultimately represents the male seed that enters the temple ovum to fertilize it. We will go over the specifics of this process now. Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Leviticus 23 27. The Day of Atonement, also called Yom Kippur, was a special event that happened once a year in the biblical tabernacles and temples. On this day, the high priest parted the veil of the most holy place to perform specific rituals with regards to the Ark of the Testimony. One of the most important of these was to sprinkle blood in the most holy place. And now that we know that the tabernacles and temples are a picture of the female egg cell, we can begin to piece together what exactly the sprinkling of blood signified. And because this topic can get rather technical very quickly, we will focus on just a few of the rituals done on the Day of Atonement, as they pertain to the moment of conception. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Leviticus 16:14. The sprinkling of blood, as well as other rituals, were done so that sin could be atoned for. This would last for an entire year before the Day of Atonement services had to be performed once again to atone for the sins of the people. All these ceremonies were of course a prefiguring of how the blood of Jesus would ultimately atone for sin once and for all. Something important to notice here is that the high priest has changed wardrobe. Gone is the beautiful garment representing the feminine aspects of the female temple seed. The garments worn on the Day of Atonement were plain linen. This was only for the entering of the Most Holy Place, where the Ark of the Covenant was. This alteration in wardrobe signified that a role change has just occurred. Think of the masculine Holy Ghost that helped Mary conceive. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 1.20. The high priest is now playing the part of a type of holy genetic engineer, in the form of the Holy Ghost. This is where the magic will happen to create a new life form. The sprinkling of blood represents how the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent mingle within the nucleus of the cell to produce the offspring. In short, the sprinkling of blood represents the process of fertilization within the tabernacle ovum to create the zygote. Looking further into Leviticus 16:14, we find that the first sprinkling of blood is that of a bullock. This blood represents the DNA of one of the parents that will mingle later with the blood of a goat. An important question arises. Which parent does the blood of the bullock represent, the mother or the father? To answer this question, we must do a little digging. 
And the Lord plagued the people, because they made the calf, which Aaron made. Exodus 32 35. Aaron, who became the first high priest, was the one who made the famous golden calf of Exodus. Scholars suggest that the reason a bullock was used to sprinkle blood was to serve as a reminder of this event. Thus, the bullock atones for the sins of the high priest. And, since the high priest is representative of the feminine aspects of the tabernacle's igot, it is only fitting that the bullock ultimately represents the DNA of the mother. The golden calf was most likely in the image of Hathor, the Egyptian goddess who later became Isis. Hathor's name means womb of Horus. The Israelites were worshipping the divine feminine and the earth mother. Proof of this may be found in the allegory of Hagar and Mount Sinai. Now Sarai Abram's wife bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Genesis 16 1. Hagar was an Egyptian woman. The Bible goes out of its way to mention this several times. There is something important here that we must uncover. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Galatians 4.24. This is an extremely important verse for those wishing to truly understand what the Bible is all about. Hagar and Sarah are allegories of the Old Testament and New Testament. This is quite the revelation. Sarah is New Jerusalem, the womb of our future heavenly mother representing the New Testament. This means Hagar, the Egyptian woman, represents earthly Jerusalem and the womb of our earthly mother. Hagar also represents Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Of course, we all know what happened there. Notice what else is said in the verse. Mount Sinai gendereth to bondage. In other words, Hagar represents the womb of the unsaved that are cursed to reincarnate back into this world to continue in their bondage. Thus, Hagar is also representative of the golden calf of Hathor, the Egyptian woman. Both Hagar and Hathor ultimately represent the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Mystery Babylon. We will quickly go over this. And in her was found the blood of prophets, and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18.24. This verse is speaking of Mystery Babylon. She drinks the blood of all slain. This is literal. Do not be deceived by those that claim that this verse is not literal, and that it is poetry, or a figure of speech. The literal interpretation is always the best interpretation. Mystery Babylon literally drinks blood. Note too that the word all means all. This means that Mystery Babylon was there drinking the blood of the very first person ever to be slain long ago. Who was that? And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Genesis 4.11. This verse is referring to Abel, the very first person to be slain. And look who we have here drinking Abel's blood? why it is none other than earth herself. And there you have it. Earth is mystery Babylon who drinks the blood of those slain, just as the word of God teaches. But wait. Mystery Babylon is also a city. Moreover, mystery Babylon is often compared to earthly Jerusalem. How does that work if she is the earth? The earth is not a city. Is this a contradiction? No. We must add the final clues. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Matthew 23 35. This is a famous verse coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. The story of the blood and mystery Babylon does not end after she drinks it. There is a specific place it goes to. Jesus is referring to earthly Jerusalem. Notice that the blood of Abel is mentioned specifically. Notice too that the location between the temple and altar is where they would slay the sacrificial animal to obtain its blood. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. Leviticus 16:15. 
The blood of Abel and Zacharias are symbolic of the blood of the bullock and blood of the goat that are then brought all the way into the most holy place to complete the cycle. Abel was righteous, and so his blood spoke good things. And to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hebrews 12:24. What was once a cryptic passage now makes perfect sense. The blood of Abel was symbolically placed on the Ark of the Covenant to atone for the people. However, the blood of Abel was not enough to permanently atone for all time, thus the blood of Jesus speaketh better things than that of Abel. When all the evidence is added together, we find that the blood of the bullock represents the female seed of the mother. The blood of the goat represents the male seed of the father. When sprinkled together, fertilization is complete. The DNA of the mother and father are now mingled at the footstool of God. And as most Christians should know, the goat in the Bible is often a picture of wickedness. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Matthew 25 33. The goats are the unsaved that will be separated out and ultimately thrown into the lake of fire. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 41. The goat ultimately represents Satan, the devil. Once again, we have a fitting animal to match the seed of the serpent. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden after Adam and his wife partook of the forbidden fruit. Thus, it is the male seed that causes the greater corruption and sin in our genomes. Bruise thy head, bruise his heel. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3:15. In a previous presentation, we learned that in the book of Genesis, the seed of the serpent is male sperm. The seed of the woman is the ovum. Something happens at the moment of conception, by which the head of the serpent's seed is bruised. Do you see it? Look closely. The head of the male seed is bruised while entering the seed of the woman. Ouch! But wait! What is this about his heel being bruised? What does this mean? And how can there be a his when the verse is clearly speaking of a her? How about a hint? The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalms 110.1. The mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant includes the footstool of God. Notice what is being said here. The footstool is the location where the enemy is. This is where we would expect to find the serpent. Remember what we learned earlier about Satan covering the ark? Scripture is connecting the heel and the head here. Satan's very DNA is what covers the human body now. The footstool is where the seed of the serpent bruises the heel of the one sitting on the throne. This is the location where the DNA of both parents mingle to produce the zygote. Now, for the advanced student that wishes to learn more about this, we will quickly go over transfer RNA. In biology, there is a mechanism called transfer RNA that serves a vital role in the cell. It literally treads on the serpent strands of RNA to heal, repair, duplicate, etc. Notice the shape? The scientific term is called the cruciform. Yes, as in crucifix. What are the odds? It has a crown of polypeptide chains. It even has a spear piercing its side. This is called the variable loop. The cruciform has the power to tread on serpents. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 19. These concepts are found all over the Bible. The message is clear. God is wanting us to know the most intimate details of how our DNA became corrupt so long ago. In addition, God wishes to make it clear what he intends to do about it. Now then, if you are thinking that a footstool is a strange location to portray certain DNA functions and conception, I doubt many would argue with you. However, please consider that this is a theme found elsewhere in the Word of God. We must let Scripture take us where we need to go. 
observe. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Daniel 2.43. This is one of the most profound verses in the entire Bible. It describes the seed of man, otherwise known as DNA, mingling with an unspecified entity or group. This is literally describing transhumanism. The image depicted represents a timeline of human history beginning with the head and ending with the feet as a future event. So, the question is. Where on the timeline does this mingling of seed occur? Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Daniel 2.34 it was at the feet of the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that was made from iron and clay. Strange, right? Yet there it is. The seed of man mingles at the feet. Later, we will do an in-depth study regarding the meaning of the stone cut without hands. Spoiler alert. The stone is the seed of Abraham that conquers all. Again, this is all about conception. How about another verse? When he was gone out, his servants came. And when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. Judges 3.24. Earlier we learned how the word covereth had to do with conception in the most holy place, where the cherubim covered the footstool of God. Here we see that exact same word used to cover feet. Many scholars suggest that the phrase covering the feet is a euphemism for using the restroom. More specifically, it is a term meaning to expose one's genitals. Several verses in the Bible swap the word feet for private parts. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Genesis 25-26. Well, well. Look who we have here grabbing and perhaps bruising his brother's heel while coming out of the womb. It is none other than Jacob. Remember all that we have learned about Jacob? Jacob is the RNA worm called Israel. Can you believe it? In fact, Jacob's name comes from the word, heel. Clearly, there is something about RNA and DNA that grabs or bruises the heel. This time the context is childbirth. The fact that God is using Jacob to link all this together is beyond coincidence. The odds of probability are simply too high. Later in life, Jacob took advantage of his brother Esau to gain Esau's birthright. This gives us some more clues as to the deeper meaning of the heel. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and, behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Genesis 27 36. Notice the word supplanted? Jacob deceived his own father by disguising himself with fur to mimic Esau's hairy body. By doing so, Jacob received the blessings originally intended for his brother. If we look at this in a larger context, we find that this identity theft is a picture of the transhumanism events that take place at the feet of iron and clay. Could this be mankind's Achilles heel? A picture of the ultimate weakness of the human race? To try and become something we are not by supplantation? It is interesting that Jacob put on goat's fur. Is there a scapegoat theme here as well? The Scapegoat versus Reincarnation and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Leviticus 16.8. One interesting aspect of the Day of Atonement was the release of the scapegoat. In order to determine which goat gets to be the scapegoat, something called casting of lots was performed. This would be a picture of Judgment Day. Once the lot was cast, the goat who became the scapegoat must now reap what it is sown so to speak. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. 
Leviticus 16:21. After all the iniquities, transgressions and sins were transferred to the scapegoat, it was then taken far away into a barren wilderness and set free. This strange act has baffled scholars for centuries. One concern, for example, is just who is the scapegoat supposed to represent? Is it a picture of Jesus? Is it Satan? The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1.29. Christians understand Jesus to be the Lamb that takes away sin. Jesus is never a goat. And as we already covered, goats are to be separated from the lambs. In other words, the goat represents Satan and the unsaved. If Jesus was the scapegoat, then we have big problems. One problem is that the scapegoat was not killed. Another problem is that the scapegoat did not shed any blood for atonement. How is that a picture of Jesus who died and shed his blood for us? The bottom line is that the scapegoat simply is not a representation of Jesus. Moreover, the goats are ultimately thrown into the lake of fire. We are beginning to see what the scapegoat represents. We are looking at a foreshadowing of the events of the book of Revelation, where the dead are judged by the sins of their past. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Revelation 20:12. As the sins of the people were put onto the head of the scapegoat, likewise, we find that the sins of the unsaved are written in books and used to hand out their sentences. Sadly, this is the point where the church has fallen short and has failed to answer some of the most important questions facing both believers and non-believers alike. Because the church has decided to go against the biblical teaching of reincarnation, they are unable to see past this point. It is a stumbling block to them. They come to the false conclusion that all the unsaved receive the same fate and same punishment. Whether it is a hard-working family born into another religion, or whether it is the most wicked people to ever exist, all will equally burn and be tormented to infinity, according to the church. They will cry and scream in sheer agony, with no hope of ever being released from this unimaginable curse. Thankfully, many people are waking up to how utterly ridiculous this teaching is. The Bible teaches us that the unsaved get another chance. And so, through the story of the scapegoat, we can finally solve the mystery, as to what the ultimate fate of those thrown into the lake of fire is. The scapegoat being cast into the wilderness is a picture of the unsaved being cast into the lake of fire, however the story does not end there. Most folks understand the modern interpretation of the scapegoat. It is a person on which the crimes of another person is placed upon. The scapegoat thus receives all the blame and, in some cases, pays the price for something someone else did. A question arises. Does the scapegoat in the Bible convey a similar concept? The answer is a resounding yes. The scapegoat is indeed paying the price for something someone else did, however it is not unjustified. There is a plot twist here that needs to be understood. For you see, the person that committed the crimes placed onto the scapegoat is none other than our own past lives. Yes, you heard that correctly. The unsaved scapegoats that are cast into the lake of fire will begin a new life with the sins of the past placed upon them. In other words, they will reap what they sow. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 7. Most folks do not understand that this verse applies to those that are reincarnated. This is like the concept of karma. Imagine the surprise and shock of those who mocked God and did evil. They will pay in their next life. All is fair. All is just. And most importantly, we all came from there. This is a most humbling and sobering truth. If you are living a life of suffering, Perhaps it is time to acknowledge your past crimes and begin making up for them. Chances are you will be blessed for it. Note, however, that not all come back to live a harsh life of correction. 
Some come back to serve a greater purpose. We will go over an amazing example. Joseph the Scapegoat Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. Genesis 37 3. Earlier we learned about how Jacob was later renamed to Israel. We also learned that Jacob Israel is representative of DNA and genetics, and that he even peeled helical stripes in rods so that his livestock would conceive. Just what were the livestock? Goats and sheep. Certain ones are kept, while others are not. They were separated. This brings us to the coat of many colors. Joseph was the favored son of Israel. The code is another important key in deciphering the genetic Bible code. One of the things that the code of many colors represents is New Jerusalem, whose foundation contains many beautiful colors as well. Thus, the code of many colors represents New Jerusalem, Sarah, the Heavenly Mother, and of course the High Priest garments of beauty. The coat also represents genetics. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and, behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Genesis 37 9. This is a fascinating verse. Joseph's family is being represented by the sun, moon and stars. The sun is representative of Joseph's father. The moon is representative of Joseph's mother. The stars are representative of the children born unto the sun and moon. In this case, it is Joseph's siblings. These connections will play an important role in deciphering the book of Revelation with all its incredible symbolism. In the occult world, the sun and moon are often symbols of father and mother as well. This is especially true when it comes to alchemical weddings. Note how the sun and moon join to form a chromosome. Images such as these were created long before their discovery. Was there a spirit at work here? Were they inspired by the Bible or something else? And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Genesis 37:10. Here we have confirmation that even Joseph's father understood the sun, moon and stars metaphor. We will come back to these revelations later. Let there be no doubt that Joseph's family was a little more than annoyed at the dreams Joseph had. In fact, Joseph's brothers were so bothered by them that they conspired against Joseph to kill him. Come now therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit, and we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. Genesis 37 20. Pay close attention to the code here. Joseph's brothers want to slay Joseph and cast him into a pit and let an evil beast devour him. Does this remind you of anything? Think of the goats that get cast into the lake of fire and are devoured by Apollyon the destroyer. Think of Sarah's womb as an allegory for the pit from which the Israelites were digged. Now watch what happens next. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. Genesis 37 22. The pit is synonymous with the wilderness that the scapegoat was cast into. Note that Joseph was stripped of his coat of many colors. This is a picture of the unsaved walking in nakedness and shame. It is also a picture of the unsaved being denied the glorified body. Joseph has become a picture of the scapegoat whose blood was not shed. But remember, there are two goats on the Day of Atonement. The other goat does indeed have its blood shed and is mingled with the seed of the woman. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. Genesis 37 31. Nothing in the Bible is there just for dramatic effect. Every verse has a deeper meaning and purpose. God is showing us how the blood of a goat is mingled with the coat of many colors after someone is thrown in a pit in the wilderness. All signs point to the Day of Atonement. 
The blood of the bullock, representing the seed of the mother, and blood of the goat, representing the seed of the father, are mingled in the most holy place of the tabernacle's igot. Note that, regardless of the gender of the animal sacrificed, blood is a masculine word in Hebrew. Here is where things get a bit esoteric. If we wish to understand the meat of the word, that is to say, the adult version of things, we must look at the ovum and sperm as the bride and groom. Once this is understood, many prophecies in the Bible will begin to make better sense. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. 1 Corinthians 6.16. This is what the marriage supper is all about. The two shall become one flesh. However, most Christians are unaware that there are two versions of it. The one you and I had previously is the one described in this verse. We were joined to Mystery Babylon by partaking of the forbidden fruit zygote, fertilized by Satan, to incarnate into this world. The mystery schools call it Hieros Gamos. And, because it is a mystery to them, they may never realize that what they are trying to obtain is simply reincarnation back into this slave system. How sad. The other version of the marriage supper is of course what is described in the book of Revelation. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Revelation 19.9. This is the marriage supper Christians look forward to. The blood of the goat of Satan is replaced by the blood of the Lamb. Thus, the groom is the lion of the tribe of Judah, representing the male seed. The bride represents all who are saved. Christians sometimes refer to the saved as the church. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 2. So many are confused by this passage. They do not understand that it truly is literal. Our very soul will be mingled with the seed of Abraham to become born again into the glorified body. Remember also that the bride is cleaned up and made ready. This brings us back to Joseph. There is an incredible prophecy involving Joseph, the marriage supper of the Lamb and the union of the twelve tribes. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. Ezekiel 37 19. What you are seeing here is a very important clue when it comes to biblical genetic codes. The two sticks represent a special genetic engineering process by which the DNA of humanity will be repaired and cleansed of sin one day to produce the glorified body. It is the merging of seed. Two shall become one. By the way, the symbol for Ephraim, the stick of Joseph, is the bullock. The symbol for Judah is the lion. Are you getting the idea? The lion of Judah joins with the bullock to become one flesh in the new heaven and new earth. Everyone is born again into the glorified body. Speaking of born again, whatever happened to Joseph? And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came, and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Genesis 42 6. Joseph began a new life in Egypt. This new life was so different, it was as if Joseph was born again as a completely different person, speaking a new language, and ultimately becoming almost as powerful as the Pharaoh. There is a subtle reincarnation theme here. And, just to be fair, we should point out that Joseph becomes a type of savior. Yes, Joseph the scapegoat is playing a role that reminds us of Jesus. It is up to you the student on whether you wish to link the scapegoat with Jesus. Remember, Jesus in scripture is generally the lamb, not the goat. However, for those looking to push the envelope with this concept, we will briefly go over a very controversial topic. I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Revelation 22 16. 
there are those who believe Jesus was reincarnated too. Of course, this is something that would be considered blasphemy in a typical church. However, look at what is being said here. Many verses in the Bible allude to Jesus being David, the root of Jesse, yet Jesus is saying he is the son of David. This theme can be found in many places in the Bible. The Book of the Generation of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Matthew 1 1. There we see it again. How can Jesus literally be the Son of David, especially when Jesus is referred to as David in the Bible? And how can Jesus also be the Son of Abraham? Two fathers? Of course, Jesus was born long after Abraham and David passed away. What is going on here? Is it a figure of speech? Is this a way of tracing lineage and nothing more? Or is this literal? Was Jesus purified in a furnace of earth seven times? These are tough questions that again, only you can answer for yourself. Living Stones Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Isaiah 51 1. Here we have two special words. Rock and pit. The Israelites are said to be hewn from a rock and digged from a pit. Does this mean that the Israelites were between a rock and a hard place and God somehow dug them out of their predicament? The very next verse answers the question. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Isaiah 51 2. The rock is a reference to Abraham. The pit is a reference to Sarah. But why describe these two in such a way? This is God giving us yet another important clue to understanding the Bible biology code. The word rock is a euphemism for male seed or sperm. The word pit is a euphemism for the uterus. This is the meat of the word. Note that once these codes are understood in one place in the Bible, they can be understood elsewhere. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. Psalms 7 14. Pay attention to the highlighted words. The theme here should be obvious. The words conceived, travaileth and brought forth is all about childbirth. Seems straightforward enough. Now, look what happens when we read the next verse. Think of the parables that Jesus often taught. We are about to understand the true meaning. He made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. Psalms 7 15. The word conceived is contrasted with the word digged. Think of how a seed is planted in the earth. The concept is similar. The word travaileth is contrasted with the word pit. The person has dug his own grave so to speak and is considered twice dead. The words brought forth is contrasted with the word fallen. Those that are thrown into the lake of fire are reincarnated back into this world to reap what they have sown. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. How about another example? Of the rock that begat thee thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Deuteronomy 32:18. Since when do rocks give birth to people? When that rock is male seed. The code is becoming more and more obvious. Moreover, this is all building up to something. There is a revelation coming. The rock referred to here can have a spiritual meaning. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 4. We are introduced to the concept of the spiritual rock which we are told is Jesus. What is the deeper significance here? The word spiritual has several meanings. One definition is that spiritual means something that is non-material, in other words, it is not of the flesh. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15:44. Do you see it now? There is a spiritual rock, or rather, spiritual seed that will create the glorified body one day. This spiritual seed is different from the carnal or earthly seed that originally begat you and me.
for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Deuteronomy 32:31. The earthly rock is the body of corruption. The goal of the Christian is to not to become born again from this seed. Amen? This brings us to the lively stones. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 5. What all this boils down to is that the rocks and living stones of the Bible are basically references to the nitrogenous bases we studied earlier. These rocks form DNA which build up a tabernacle house. This brings us to the stone with seven eyes. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Zechariah 3 9. In this remarkable verse, we learn that a stone with seven eyes will receive a new engraving on it. Once this occurs, the land will be purged of sin. But wait. The Bible teaches that only Jesus can remove sins. How is it possible that a simple stone will accomplish the same thing by having some words engraved upon it? You know the answer. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation 5 6. Yes, of course. The stone with seven eyes is another reference to Jesus and the spiritual seed that will heal the nations one day. But why seven eyes? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Matthew 6:22. In our Ezekiel's atomic wheels study, we learned that light is electromagnetism. The Word of God is teaching us that the eye is synonymous with our modern word for the electron. Thus, the stone with seven eyes is a reference to the chemical element nitrogen, which has seven electrons. More specifically, the stone with seven eyes is synonymous with a nitrogenous base. What is so fascinating about all this is that God wants us to know the specific details of just how our sins will be cleansed. This is a real thing that can be quantified and understood down to the quantum scale. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Luke 8 11. Verses like these make it obvious that only a highly advanced being could have encoded this information in a book thousands of years before man had the slightest clue what seed truly is. DNA contains words, just like a book. Whether it is the seed of a plant or a seed of an animal, the Word of God contains the instructions necessary to create life. Let us review this again. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1:14. The Word of God becoming flesh is a perfect picture of how RNA and DNA forms life. The new engraving that is coated into the stone with seven eyes nitrogenous base is essentially a new genetic code. And, since Jesus is also synonymous with the Word of God, we can see that Scripture fits perfectly together as a cohesive whole. The Bible genetic code is becoming clearer and clearer. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3.29 Although Abraham's seed can be thought of as an earthly form of genealogy, the idea here is that Abraham's seed is a picture of the spiritual seed of Christ, which is our rock of salvation. The Two Witnesses And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 11:3. A favorite prophecy amongst Christians today is the prophecy of the two witnesses. The focus is almost exclusively based on who these two famous figures are, rather than what their purpose, testimony and ultimate meaning is. In this presentation, we will concentrate on what the Word of God has to say about them, by using the Kingdom of God within as our basis. 
Once we do this, we may just discover exactly what they will be saying to the world that makes the earth dwellers so angry. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Revelation 11 4. Since we already know that the candlestick represents mitochondrial DNA, we are off to an easy start. The two witnesses are somehow representative of DNA and something to do with olive trees. Perhaps their mission is to let the world know that transhumanism is the final straw and that God must now terminate the experiment. We will now decipher what the two olive trees are. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Psalms 52 8. According to this verse, the temple of God contains olive trees. Not only that, but we see that they represent people. Which component of the temple of God could the olive tree be? And within the oracle he made two cherubims of olive tree, each ten cubits high. 1 Kings 6 23. Because King Solomon's temple was a permanent structure and bigger than the tabernacle in the wilderness, there was now ample room for more bells and whistles to be added. And so, next to the Ark of the Covenant with its two cherubim, were placed two more cherubim. These were much larger than the ones on the Ark. What part of the biological cell could these two cherubim of olive tree represent? The cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, as we have already covered, represent the two strands of DNA that make up the human genome. And since the most holy place is the nucleus of the cell, we can look once again at the kingdom of God within to discover what else resides there. The nucleus of the cell is filled with chromosomes comprised of large strands of DNA, often containing all the genetic material of a life form. And since the two cherubim of olive tree are larger versions of the cherubim on the ark, we can already see where this is going. Chromosomes are generally made of two chromatids that are joined together. The name comes from chroma, meaning color. Think of the rainbow covenant God made with mankind. So, if the two cherubim of olive tree are much larger versions of DNA, it would be logical to conclude that they represent chromosomes. And since there are two chromatids that make up a chromosome, we can conclude that each cherubim would each represent a single chromatid. Note that the two chromatids joined together often form a cross or crucifix. Who was it that died on a cross? And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Ephesians 2.16. Jesus died on the cross. And look what is being said here. The enmity that happened all the way in the Garden of Eden is slain. The two becoming one. The moment of conception. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent joining together to produce the corrupted chromosomes that mankind inherited from Satan and Mystery Babylon. Now you know what the cross and serpent on a pole ultimately represents. Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. It is within the chromosome and DNA where the corrections must be made. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Hebrews 10 19-20. The veil that separated the holy from the most holy place represented the flesh of Jesus. It was sown with cherubim. Get it? Another example of how the literal interpretation is always the most revealing. The word of DNA becomes chromosomes and flesh. And look what happened to the temple veil when Jesus died. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Mark 15:37-38. The veil with the cherubim sewn onto it was torn. Therefore, when Jesus died, the cherubim were split apart. When we look at this from the point of view of the biological cell, we see the moment of conception played in reverse. It is as if the mother genetics is being separated from the father genetics. In other words, the genetics of Satan is removed from the DNA. Iniquity is purged. Enmity is slain. The stone with seven eyes will have a new engraving. 
the blood of Jesus will wash clean the sin of man. Let us look at another green olive tree verse. The Lord called thy name, a green olive tree, fair, and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Jeremiah 11:16. In this context, the green olive tree represents the genetics of Israel and Judah. Thus, the green olive tree represents a chromatid. What about the branches? The branches would be the DNA that makes up the chromatid. Notice what is happening to the branches in this verse. They are burned and broken. What is the significance of this? The branches that are broken and burned represent the genetics of those thrown into the lake of fire. The purpose of the lake of fire is to get rid of bad genetics. This brings us to a rather shocking truth. If the entire point of the Bible could be summarized in one word, that word would be salvation. However, there is a word that is not so politically correct that describes the Bible more accurately. That word is eugenics. Yes, you heard that correctly. The meaning of life, the reason why we are all here, is to be corrected. Not just mentally, but both mentally and physically, down to our very DNA, our souls. We all exist in a type of correctional facility that is ultimately designed to transform our individual genomes into something that is more desirable to God. Like it or not, this is the reality of the situation we are in. Those of you that are of an advanced mindset, in other words, those that understand that the lake of fire is the portal to reincarnation and not an infinite place of suffering, will be able to appreciate what God is trying to do here. You understand that the human race is scheduled for termination for a good reason. The overabundance of evil and suffering is no longer sustainable. Something must be done. This species simply cannot be allowed to continue on Earth, much less to other planets and galaxies, without something being done about our corrupt souls. Be thankful that an upgrade option exists and that it is offered as a free will choice. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Zechariah 3 2. The milk of the word may interpret this verse as meaning that Israel was saved from years of misery, defeat, hard times, etc. The meat of the word, however, is that this is a picture of all of us that have been curiously wrought from the lowest parts of the earth. We are children of Gehenna. We are brands plucked from the lake of fire. Some are predestined to become saved, while others continue the cycle of death and rebirth. Of those that will be saved, there will be a change of raiment. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Zechariah 3 4. This is a picture of becoming born again. Raiment is a picture of a body and soul. A change of raiment is a new body and new soul. If we keep following the context of the verses in this chapter, we find that this scene is all about receiving the glorified body. The iniquity is passed from the branch. Sin is removed. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou, and thy fellows that sit before thee for they are men wondered at. For, behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Zechariah 3 8. Many Christians believe that this is a prophecy of Jesus. Notice what Joshua is called. He is referred to as the branch. In other words, Joshua represents Jesus the high priest who represents a branch of DNA. This branch will one day take away the sins of the world. You already know the next verse. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Zechariah 3 9. You are now beginning to see how all this works. The genetics of the human race will one day be corrected by a special branch of DNA. This is what the blood of Jesus is all about. 
And with these revelations, we can now decipher the two olive tree prophecy written in the next chapter of Zechariah. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Zechariah 4:2. The vision begins with a candlestick that is a bit different than the ones used in the tabernacles and temples. This one has a bowl on top and seven pipes. It also has seven eyes. This candlestick represents the lamb with seven eyes. It is the word of God nucleobase. Once again, we see confirmation that the candlestick represents DNA. For who hath despised the day of small things? for they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Zechariah 4.10. Each eye is a lamp. This matches the vision of Ezekiel. They are the electrons that run to and fro through the earth. Light is electromagnetism. Notice the phrase day of small things? Could this have a literal meaning? Think of how tiny DNA is. The plummet is the center hydrogen bonds that everything is built from. From small beginnings, the word of God grows and multiplies. Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? Zechariah 4.11. The two olive trees are of course the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation. They pour golden oil into the bowl. Most scholars agree that the golden oil represents the Holy Spirit. As for the name of the two witnesses, this is a subject of great controversy. There is an interesting translation, however, that gives us some insight. Then he said, These are the two sons of fresh oil Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the prince of Judah, who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth as his anointed ones. Zechariah 4.14, Amplified Bible. In the Amplified Bible translation, we see that the two witnesses are Joshua and Zerubbabel. If we view them from a new heaven and new earth perspective, then Joshua and Zerubbabel become a combined priest and king. This would make sense since the two chromatids join to form one chromosome. The united pair would be the order of Melchizedek, the DNA of the glorified body. A type of holy genetic engineering is being shown here. Two shall become one. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? Romans 11:24. In this remarkable passage, we can clearly see gene splicing taking place. It literally speaks for itself. The fine print of salvation is laid out for all to see as a type of informed consent. Nothing about the process is hidden. For the Lord of hosts, that planted thee, hath pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Jeremiah 11:17. Remember the two sticks that become one? Judah and Ephraim are also called olive trees. Branches are burned and broken. Bad genetic traits are done away with. Again, we are looking at eugenics. To summarize, the two sticks of Judah and Ephraim will one day be joined to form the Melchizedek chromosome. The marriage supper of the Lamb is complete. Earth is united in the glorified body. Amen. Mountain King Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Zechariah 4.7. Mountains in the Bible are one of those hidden in plain sight euphemisms with profound meaning. Take the very first word of this verse for example. Did the translators make a mistake? Since when are mountains addressed as a who? In general, we tend to regard mountains as a what and not a who. In other words, a mountain is not a person, but rather an obstacle in the way. Yet, for some reason, this mountain is addressed as if they are a person. In Crowley's tarot card called the devil, 
we see a rather bold interpretation of what the devil ultimately represents. It is a devil's tower for sure. The artist seems to know something about the mystery as to why the mountain is a who and not a what. According to Crowley, the image on the card is symbolic of both a mountain and a tree. According to the Bible, the great mountain Zerubbabel is referring to as Satan and the male generative principle. And because we have already been studying some of the themes presented in the image, we can decipher them with ease. We begin at the bottom. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Jonah 2 6. The story of Jonah is a foreshadowing of the lake of fire where the unsaved go to be reincarnated. The bottoms of the mountains is where we find the seed of the serpent, in other words male sperm. Jonah is here, in the same place where the prisoners are kept. Jonah is surrounded by the prison bars of mystery Babylon, the earth mother. This is a picture of conception. Jesus went to the heart of the earth to preach to these prisoners. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. 1 Peter 3:19. These prisoners are those that are going to be given another chance at salvation. Note that Jonah is ultimately vomited out of this phallic mountain and onto dry land, the womb of mystery Babylon, the earth mother. The seed is planted in the fertile soil to grow. Now you know what vomiting out really means. Later in this presentation, we will learn that the dragon casts a flood at the woman on the moon. Can you guess what the flood and moon represent? The concept is the same. Just as the Bible contains similar themes repeated in various symbols and allegory, the same holds true for the Crowley Devil Tarot. Crowley also associates the image with the Sephirotic Tree of Kabbalah. It is often called the Tree of Life, but we know it is the Tree of Death, the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil. It is where the Forbidden Fruit resides. Interestingly, there are ten sephirates reminding us of the ten kings on the beast. All ten sephirat combined to have one mind. This little horn is the person you see growing from the tree, Adam Cadman. Again, the fruits are avam. The seed of the serpent fertilizes mystery Babylon's tree roots. What about that goat? Crowley suggests it is Pan, the god of the wilderness. Of course, if you have been paying attention, the goat of the wilderness is none other than the scapegoat that is sent into the wilderness on the Day of Atonement. The scapegoat represents the child that is conceived into the world we live in. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14:12. The left-hand path leads once again to reincarnation. Notice that the top of the mountain or tree reaches into heaven. Lucifer is described as a tree that is cut down to the ground. We can really see how the entire process works now. The fallen angels descend into the lowest parts of the earth to be born again of corruptible flesh. Incredible. When the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, they knew. What did they know? They were witness to the afterlife and what happens to those that are unsaved they saw it for themselves. They are crowned with the mitochondrial DNA passed down from the mother. Let us not forget what we learned about Mount Sinai. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Galatians 4.24. Mount Sinai represented Hagar and bondage into reincarnation. It is the mountain representing the curse of the law. Moses went to the header tip of the mountain to receive the seed, the word of God. After Moses retrieved God's seed, he climbed down to give this seed to God's bright Israel. Think of Abraham representing the father about to conceive a child. Unfortunately, the womb that Abraham's seed went into was that of Hathor, in other words, Hagar, the Egyptian woman. Again, this is a picture of being born into bondage and into a body of corruptible flesh, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses's anger waxed hot, 
and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Exodus 32 19. Moses cast God's seed to Mother Earth. It was done reluctantly in a manner reminiscent of how Abraham was reluctant to conceive a child with Hagar. There is an interesting take on this perspective in an animated film called Cedar Masochism by Nina Paley. Here we see Moses descending from a phallic-shaped Mount Sinai. God is jealous that Israel has played the harlot and cheated on him. This movie is free to watch on the various streaming video platforms. Now that we have wisdom with regards to what mountains represent, we are ready to solve another great mystery. Are you ready? And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. Revelation 17 9. Mystery Babylon is said to be sitting on seven mountains. In other words, Mystery Babylon played the harlot with the seed of the serpent to give birth to seven antichrists throughout the course of history. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Jeremiah 3 6. Do you see it now? Israel played the harlot with the high mountain and tree. Each head of the beast represents their offspring. The king of Egypt. The king of Assyria. The king of Babylon. The king of Medo-Persia. The king of Greece. And the king of Rome. A future king is prophesied to arrive one day. Note that the beast is Cain, who was the first reincarnation of Satan. Cain reincarnates seven more times to become each head of the beast. Cain is the eighth and is of the seven. Cain is the beast that was, is not, yet is. But what about good mountains? Does the Bible have anything to say about an opposite version of the mountain of Satan? Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2.35. Because we already know that the stone represents Abraham's seed, we can understand why it becomes a great mountain. This great mountain is none other than Mount Zion. It is the replacement genetics for Satan's corrupt seed. It destroys the hybrid humans. There is more to discover here. This mountain fills the whole earth. In other words, Abraham's seed joins with Sarah to complete the marriage supper of the Lamb. Sarah represents the new earth. She is made pregnant by the mountain phallus. Abraham's seed is represented by the Lamb and the 144,000 that flow from the head of the mountain. And I looked, and, lo, a Lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Revelation 14 1. The 144,000 have the father's name written on their foreheads. In other words, they represent the new genetic code that will upgrade humanity to the glorified body. They are of the order of Melchizedek. The allegory of Hagar, the Old Testament, and Sarah the New Testament, is all about the born-again process via euphemism, the meat of the word. On the left, we see Mystery Babylon sitting, or rather, playing the harlot with the seed of the serpent. This produces a body of corruption. On the right we see New Jerusalem consummating the marriage between the Lamb and his bride. This produces the glorified body. Both are pictures of procreation, earthly versus heavenly. The Revelation Within The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Revelation 1-1. The last book of the Bible is like a teacher's edition schoolbook with the answers in the back. The book of Revelation is where we find that the Bible code is most condensed. Because of this, it is considered the most difficult book in the Bible to interpret by many. Many researchers of the book of Revelation tend to use current geopolitics, news events, world leaders, etc., in an attempt to crack the code. 
They may conclude for example that China is the dragon and Russia is the bear, or that the United Nations is the beast, or the United States is mystery Babylon, etc. They may say things like microchips are the mark of the beast because, why not? It makes good clickbait. Thankfully, we know better than to jump to conclusions. If we are going to understand the deepest mysteries of the book of Revelation, we must begin where God teaches us to begin. Where is that? Where should we look first? Seek and ye shall find. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6:33. The kingdom of God is what everyone on the planet should be seeking, regardless of belief. We here at most holy place believe that the kingdom of God is within, meaning our very own anatomy and biology. This includes the very atoms, particles, laws of physics, etc. that make up the physical world inside of us. The kingdom of God is literally life itself. And although the Bible teaches this concept in abundance, tragically, the typical Christian still views this as paganism. The very key to deciphering prophecy is kept far away from their grasp. Neither shall they say, lo here, or lo there. For, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17 21. When we do as God commands, and take this verse literally, something incredible happens. Life itself acts as a sort of error-correcting algorithm that helps us precisely interpret the Bible. It acts as a powerful witness that we can utilize whenever we need to cast away the noise of false teachings. To this end, we will interpret part of the book of Revelation using the kingdom of God within method, and we will see where it leads us. The great thing about using this method is that anyone with a basic knowledge of biology can try it for themselves. You will no doubt discover things that are not covered in this study. That is the goal. We will begin with the seven candlesticks. Since you already know they represent DNA, this will be another easy lesson. Seven Candlesticks And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Revelation 1.12 By now, some of the imagery from this point forward should look familiar. We see eyes as lamps on top of candle holders. Note that these are not seven separate menorahs, but rather seven branches of a single menorah. Symbols used in the book of Revelation are some of the most revealing in the entire Bible. We will start with the seven eyes. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11:2. The seven eyes represent the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Each one has a quality associated with it. These qualities are like a type of electronic communication from God to the born-again believer. The purpose is to teach and guide the Christian in a supernatural way. Since the eye represents the electron and power of the Holy Ghost, we know that this is a real and tangible thing. The Holy Ghost teaches us literally through the power of electromagnetism. Cloven tongues as of fire sat upon people on the day of Pentecost and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Revelation 1.13. Each of these seven candlesticks surround a being that looked like the Son of Man. This being represents the center of the menorah that all the branches attach to. Thus, each candle holder is one branch that is part of the whole. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. John 15 5. Jesus is the vine by which the branches are attached, producing fruit. In this amazing revelation, we discover that each branch of the menorah represents an individual person. These are the servants and messengers of God. Many artist depictions can be found showing this concept. Let us not forget Zechariah 3 8 where the servant called the branch is prophesied. What else can we find? 
The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Revelation 1:20. We now have confirmation that the individual candle holders are indeed representative of the church and its members. In addition, we find that there are seven stars or seven angels belonging to each church. Since we know that each branch contains a nucleobase, we can deduce that each church member is like an individual letter of DNA that combined to form the body of Christ. The Word made flesh. This is an astonishing revelation. The Son of Man at the center of the menorah represent the hydrogen bonds that hold the nucleotide branches together. We can now combine this information with other verses that reference the word star. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Genesis 15 5. We learned earlier in this study that stars represented children. Here we find that stars represent seed as well. Jesus is the morning star, the seed of Abraham. Jesus is the nucleobase and word of God. Thus, the stars are representative of nitrogenous bases that form the child in the womb. Indeed, everything in the Bible combines to give the student an incredibly rich amount of wisdom. 7 Churches I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And, what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Revelation 1 10 11. The letters to the seven churches are so packed with prophecy that it would take many presentations to go through it all. Unfortunately, we must keep things brief for now and just cover some of the basics. Each letter has a specific structure by which it is written. They all begin with a church name. They then describe the author's title and characteristics. Next, the strengths and weaknesses of each church are laid out. And finally, there is a reward for those that overcome. This special letter structure is like a cipher that, when combined, reveals some of the deepest mysteries in the Bible. We will now go over one of these churches to get an idea of how the cipher works. Pergamos is a perfect choice, as it is packed with information about our DNA and how it relates to the seed of Satan. Are you ready? Church of Pergamos And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Revelation 2.12. This verse gives us the first two parts of the letter structure, which are the church name and the title and characteristics of the author. We begin with the name of the church, Pergamos. Pergamos or Pergamon was a rich and powerful ancient Greek city. The remains of Pergamos are located on the west coast of Turkey, next to the Aegean Sea. This area was known as Asia Minor. Italy can be seen on the left side of the map. Even the name Pergamos has very interesting clues as to what this church was about. In this graphic, we see one interpretation is that Pergamos is the church that married the world. In Greek, gamos means wedding. Per may stand for pergos, meaning watchtower. Per may also mean with regards to. When combined, we get Pergamos, or with regards to marriage. As we will soon see, this would be an inappropriate marriage. Think of the opposite of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The tarot card called the Tower portrays a tower shaped as a phallus, in which a male and a female can be seen falling from it. The two shall become one as a spirit falls like lightning from heaven. A new king is born out of the flames of the lake of fire and out of the head of the beast. Pergamos is known for many things, especially its temples and sanctuaries. The one shown here is a reconstruction of the great altar of Pergamon in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, Germany. Some suggest that this is where the seat of Satan was located. 
Does this match what the Bible teaches? This is where it becomes important to add up all the components of the letter structure so that we can make a precise determination. The author's title and characteristics is the next component to plug into the equation. The sharp sword with two edges will help teach us where the seed of Satan is. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. A common teaching in the Bible is that the sword represents the word of God. This sword is where soul and spirit are divided. This is literal. We already know that spirit is the electron and electromagnetism. We also know that the soul is a life form's DNA and genome. The branch is the servant, which represents the body with its joints, marrow and heart. Thus, we have body, soul and spirit represented in the verse. To summarize, the sword with two edges represents the DNA of the body, where soul and spirit are divided. Note that the iron rod that Jesus holds is representative of electromagnetism. This matches with the iron of the sword representing spirit. The Iron Kingdom will be a very technologically advanced kingdom. We now move to the next component of the letter structure, strengths. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipa was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Revelation 2.13 here we have the famous verse about the location of the seat of Satan. Where in Pergamos could this be? There are many to choose from. Just look at them all. Dionysus. Demeter. Athena. Serapis. Hera. Trajan. Of all the temples and sanctuaries in Pergamos, none match the seat of Satan as perfectly as that of the sanctuary of Asclepius. Why is this? And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Numbers 21.8. The sanctuary of Asclepius is where they went to worship the serpent on a pole, the god of healing. Asclepius was said to have been such a skilled doctor that he could even raise people from the dead. Was this Jesus or an imposter? Obviously, this supposed god of healing was none other than the great imposter himself, Satan, disguised as a typical snake oil salesman. The medical and drug industry still uses the serpent on a rod symbol to this very day. It has become ubiquitous. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. Isaiah 14 13. Ultimately, the seed of Satan is in the hearts of mankind and in his very DNA. To the Christian, the goal is to swap Satan for God, so that God sits in our hearts and writes a new name in our genetics, in the tables of the heart. Let us now look at the weaknesses of the Church of Pergamos. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Revelation 2.14. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life can be seen here. So, what is the doctrine of Balaam? Look no further than the current medical industry with its endless greed. Which have forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. 2 Peter 2.15. It would seem that the medical and drug industry loves money more than life itself. Doctors are truly baffled as to where all the money comes from as people all over the world die from experimental gene therapies. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. Revelation 2 17. 
The final piece of the letter structure for the Church of Pergamos completes the puzzle. This is the reward for overcomers. The hidden manna represents deoxyribose. The sweet sugar in our DNA. Think of the nutrients that a seed needs to sprout. It is also the bread from heaven connected with the white stone. The white stone is of course the word of God nitrogen base. The stone with seven eyes. It is the blood of the lamb. It is Abraham's seed. The new name is the new genetic sequence that will be written on it to take away sin. When we add up all the pieces of the letter structure, we find that everything works together to tell the tale of salvation through the kingdom of God within and the blood of Christ. One final note is that, according to legend, Antipa was slain by being placed inside of a brazen bull, which was modeled after the ancient god Moloch. Bulls, cows, oxen etc. in the Bible all have a common meaning, and it all goes back to the golden calf. The golden calf in the book of Exodus was Hathor, the Egyptian strange woman. Hathor was the earth mother that represented the womb and the mystery of iniquity. The pit. Reincarnation. Marriage to the world. Pergamos. House and key. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9.1. The star represents a child about to be conceived. The bottomless pit represents the womb of mystery Babylon. This does not necessarily have to be a human mother. Think of mother nature and all various forms of life. What about the key? What does it represent? And who is the child? To answer these questions, we will look at another verse involving keys. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Isaiah 22 22. The concept here is straightforward. A key is often used to lock and unlock the door of a house. In this case, it is the house of David. So, what is the house of David? Is it a literal building found somewhere on earth? Is it a bloodline or family tree? A great way to understand words and concepts in the Bible is to look at its opposite. The house of David is something that is righteous and represents freedom from bondage. Thus, the opposite of a house of freedom would be an unrighteous house of bondage. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 22. And here we are, back at the house that worshipped the goddess Hathor a picture of Hagar the Egyptian woman and Mystery Babylon the Earth Mother. As we learned earlier, Hagar represents bondage to this world. Egypt is the house of bondage. Interestingly, Hathor herself is a house. Her name literally means house of Horus. Obviously, Hathor is not a building. What is she? Hathor represents the womb. Whose womb? Horus, the opposite of David and the opposite of Jesus. In a much larger sense, Hathor is the womb of humanity that is in bondage to the reincarnation cycle. The opposite of Hathor is Sarah's womb, New Jerusalem. Therefore, if the house of Horus is the womb that created Horus, then the opposite would be the house of David, which is the womb that created David. In other words, the house of David is New Jerusalem, the mother of us all. Armed with this knowledge we can deduce that the key of David is what transforms a womb from being barren to being open, allowing the seed to enter and become fruitful. This can work for good, like a church door that is open, as well as evil, hence the star that falls. The person who wields the key of David can make a womb produce. Another way to look at it is that the key of David gives one the ability to create life itself from a test tube, a Petri dish, from a quantum computer, etc. The holder of the key can make angels fall like fire from the sky to become born again of corruptible flesh. It can even produce the image of the beast. False prophet and the image of the beast. The interpretation that you are about to be presented with is only one of many that are possible. It assumes that the visions in Revelation do not occur in chronological order. 
an attempt will be made to place the verses in chronological order to match the theoretical timing of events. Thus, chapters and verses may be out of sequence with each other as they are written in the Bible. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Revelation 13 1. As mentioned earlier, the vision describes Cain as the beast with seven heads. The beast, as well as each head, represents a reincarnation of Satan into human form. In other words, each head is an antichrist that ruled in the past. The seventh head is presumed to be a future antichrist that will appear one day. This antichrist world leader is eventually mortally wounded and resurrected by the false prophet. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. Revelation 13 2. The various body parts are a conglomeration of the genetics of every antichrist of the past. This beast is essentially a type of chimera, a halfuman half-beast humanoid that will rule again one day. The dragon is the spirit of Satan who reincarnates into a physical body. This is what is meant by the dragon giving the beast his power, seat and authority. Satan is literally placing his entire essence of being into an earthly body. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Revelation 13:3. Something seemingly supernatural happens to the Antichrist after he dies. His deadly wound is healed. It is this aspect of prophecy that we will now focus on. How is this deadly wound healed? For this answer, we must go back a few chapters. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9:1. The most likely candidate for this fallen star child is not Satan as many presume, but the false prophet. And, as far as the key is concerned, this was not given to the false prophet until later in his or her life. Thus, after the star falls into the womb of an earthly mother to reincarnate, many years will have passed before he takes possession of the key. We now jump ahead a few chapters to gain more insight into the false prophet. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Revelation 13 11. After the star falls and is reincarnated out of the womb of Mother Earth to become the false prophet, he begins to lead the world astray. He does this by speaking like a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13 12. Because the false prophet has the key to the bottomless pit, he can use it to do something called exerciseth. This is an interesting word. The definition is to make or manufacture something. What does the false prophet make? and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Revelation 13 14. The false prophet makes something called the image of the beast. If we add up the evidence thus far, we find that the image of the beast is the resurrected Antichrist, whose deadly wound was healed. In other words, the beast is brought back to life by way of the magic key of the bottomless pit. Since we know that the key of the bottomless pit is the ability to either create life from scratch or resurrect a previously dead person, we can imagine the false prophet as being a type of Victor Frankenstein, the fictional young scientist who created a sapient creature in the famous novel. This person would have the highest technology at their disposal. The false prophet also appears to have direct communication with the spirit of Satan. This is the opposite of Jesus communicating with the Father in heaven. The beast, false prophet and dragon are an anti-godhead. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak 
and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 13 15. This is a very big deal. Not just anyone has this kind of power. In fact, this kind of technology is something we only see in science fiction movies like Prometheus for example. This leads us to the next part of the false prophet equation. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Daniel 2.43 Yes, we must not forget this incredible prophecy of Daniel. As in the days of Noah, there will be genetic engineering happening. The big question is, who is they? We have our answer in scripture. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Revelation 13:13. 13, 13. By way of the special key, the false prophet is given the ability to make fire come down from heaven. What kind of fire is this? Are they nuclear weapons? You already know the answer. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Mark 13 25. The fire that falls are the ones in heaven that end up being tempted by the false prophet to fall to earth and reincarnate into the beast system. They are the fallen angels. They are the sons of God that will mingle themselves with the seed of men to experience life in an alien body. They will become human 2.0. They will be born again of corruptible carbon 666 and the mark of the beast. Thus, it would appear that a portion of prophecy may very well indeed be dedicated to the concept of an alien invasion. This will be difficult for many to receive. Do not be shaken in mind. Comfort one another. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2 3. And now you know what the falling away is. It will be the falling of angels into the beast system. The falling of angels is a recurring theme in the Bible. When Michael fought against Satan, both Satan as well as the angels of Satan, were cast down to earth to reincarnate. The man of sin in this verse is referring to the image of the beast. It will be created by the false prophet who was given the key of the bottomless pit. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2 7. The mystery of iniquity is reincarnation. There is a restrainer that must be taken out of the way for a very special type of reincarnation to occur. The one who restrains is Apollyon, also known as Abaddon, whose purpose is to destroy the souls of those thrown into the lake of fire. Using the key of the bottomless pit, the false prophet will take Apollyon out of the way, so that the soul of the dead Antichrist can be retrieved intact before it can be destroyed and the image of the Antichrist beast can be created and revealed to the world. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Again, the wicked mentioned here is the image of the beast. It is what the beast becomes after its deadly wound is healed. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2 9. The phrase working of Satan should be interpreted as works of the false prophet. In other words, him, the image of the beast, is coming after the works of the false prophet are manifested. Remember, it is the false prophet who has signs and lying wonders and makes fire fall from heaven. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Revelation 13 5. The image of the beast is engineered with a mouth that blasphemes God. This is also the little horn found in the book of Daniel. Pay attention to the phrase, speaking great things. I considered the horns, and, behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And, behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 7 8. 
This is confirmation that the little horn and the image of the beast are the same entity. The little horn makes war with the saints. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Daniel 7:21. This verse can be confusing as it sounds like the little horn is at war with the Christians here on earth. However, evidence is pointing to the fact that Christians may have already been taken up in the clouds to be with the Lord. In other words, the saved are already raptured. What we are seeing here is that there will be saints in heaven that will choose to leave their heavenly abode. The little horn is the one that causes the angels to fall and be birthed into the beast system. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12 9. There is an important lesson here that may be lost on those that do not understand biblical reincarnation. The saints in heaven still have the choice of free will to come back to mystery Babylon and be once again born of corruptible flesh. Daniel 8 adds more insight to this concept. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Daniel 8 9-10. The verse is clear. The little horn draws the saints of heaven to the earth. The little horn then stamps upon them. This may be a picture of receiving the mark of the beast. Note that the little horn is also called the king of fierce countenance. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences, shall stand up. Daniel 8:23. The image of the beast will understand dark sentences. In our modern era, this phrase could mean many things. One example would be a very advanced form of artificial intelligence that has little regard for humans. Another example would be an alien language from the pre-flood era. Whatever this is, one thing is for sure. It will be incredibly evil. Woman of the Apocalypse Continuing with our Kingdom of God within interpretation method, we will now go over the Woman of the Apocalypse to see what revelations it will bring us. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation 12 1. Since we have already learned what these symbols mean, this will be another easy one. The sun represents Abraham, the father. The moon represents Sarah, the mother. The stars represent the twelve tribes that eventually come from their seed. The entire scene represents the moment of conception in Sarah's womb. The sun can also represent male seed. The moon can represent the ovum. The stars are the zygotes produced after fertilization. Sarah conceives Isaac, the man-child who continues the lineage to David and to Jesus. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew 1.1. This is the very first verse of the New Testament. We see that Jesus is called the son of Abraham. This is how we know that the man-child is both Isaac and Jesus. Another way to look at this is that the saved become Abraham's seed by being grafted into the Melchizedek genetic template. And because of this, Satan becomes very upset. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Revelation 12:3. Although many see this as a future event, it can just as well be interpreted as something that happened long ago, during the time of Abraham and Sarah. The red dragon represents the male phallus that wishes to get to Sarah's ovum first to plant its serpent seed. The seed of the serpent are the stars that fall from heaven. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelation 12 4. 
The flagellum is the tail that propels the star seeds toward the seed of the woman. This is the flood cast out of the serpent's mouth. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Revelation 12 15. This flood is a flood of ungodly men. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. 2 Samuel 22 5. There is a parallel here between what is happening in heaven and what is happening on earth. Think of what happened to the Israelites escaping Egypt. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Revelation 12 6. The seed of Abraham and Sarah is now represented by the tabernacle's Igat, as well as the Israelites, who wander in the wilderness from the face of the Antichrist, the king of Egypt. The forty years of wandering is representative of forty weeks of pregnancy. The wilderness represents the womb of Mother Earth. The bloodline of Jesus is being fed and nourished during this time. The 1260 days is a prophecy with many interpretations. Again, some see this as future, however, there are some that believe each day represents a year. If this is the case, the 1260 years could fit the timeline between the Exodus and the birth of Jesus. This is something to meditate on as dates vary among scholars. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Revelation 12:16 there is that phrase again. Earth opened her mouth. This is what happened to the blood of Abel. This is also a reincarnation term, representing the uterus swallowing the male seed. It is also representative of the parting of the Red Sea event, in which the Israelites were baptized. Indeed, this is a born-again event. The connections are numerous. Meditate on this next verse and see if you understand the code. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Psalm 69 15. Do you see it now? The flood. The deep. The pit. These are all references to where the unsaved go to be reincarnated. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12 9. Considering the verses we have gone over thus far, do you still think that this is a future event? When and where does the first head of the Antichrist show up? Look at the chart. The king of Egypt is where Satan first falls to persecute the woman in the wilderness. The dragon was cast out and was angry with the woman. Speak, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon that leeth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Ezekiel 29 3. Look how the word of God literally calls the king of Egypt the great dragon. This is none other than Satan reincarnated. And what is that river? Is it the flood of ungodly men he casts out of his mouth? He made the river for himself. Interesting is it not? Satan took a third of the stars with him. It all fits. Think of all the strange mysteries surrounding ancient Egypt. Just how evil were the angels that fell there? How advanced was their DNA? Were there giants in those days? Was there time travel involved? So many questions, so little time. We turn to the book of Jude for answers. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude 1 5-6. Look at the timeline given. It is referring to the Exodus, when the Israelites fled Egypt into the wilderness. What else happened during that time? The angels left their first estate. This fits the previous verses we have been studying. If our hunch is correct, we should see something about the war in heaven, and Michael casting Satan down. 
Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Jude 1 9. And there it is. The archangel Michael was at war with Satan during the Exodus. Astonishingly, we find out that the body of Moses was being disputed about as well. Could it be that Satan was in human form when this argument took place? There is something else to meditate on here. The body of Moses can also be interpreted as the tabernacle of Moses. Could Michael and Satan be at war over the very zygote of humanity? The temple of God? The church body? The mystical body of Christ? You be the judge. Brimstone Ministers For Tophead is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared, he hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood, the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Isaiah 30 33. The breath of the Lord is often associated with spirit in the Bible, in the sense that it gives life. Here we see the opposite. The breath of the Lord is like a spirit that destroys life. It is associated with brimstone that rains down from heaven. What is this brimstone? Could this life-destroying breath of brimstone be actual living entities? Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Psalms 104.4. They are indeed living entities. These ministers are a flaming fire. What do they do? In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1.8. The phrase flaming fire is always used in the King James Bible to denote that which takes vengeance on the wicked. Therefore, the ministers of flaming fire are destroying angels. The destruction could be literal burning, or in the case of Satan and his ministers, they could be used to subtly destroy that which is righteous. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. 2 Corinthians 11 14-15. In this revealing verse, we find that Satan's ministers masquerade as angels of light as does Satan. And since we know that Satan falls like lightning, destroying things on earth, the same can be said for Satan's ministers. They fall from heaven and destroy both literally and figuratively. Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Genesis 19:24. The Lord makes his angels as spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. The breath of the Lord as brimstone destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. We are seeing some interesting connections here. Was the brimstone and fire also symbolic of fallen angels? Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude 1 7. The phrase, in like manner, is referring to what happened in Egypt, where the angels left their first estate. They sought after strange flesh, reflecting what happened before the flood when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Indeed, this has been happening for a long time. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Genesis 6 4. Although it is not clear how the sons of God came into the daughters of men, we can use our opposites technique to find the answer. The opposite to a son of God falling to earth would be Jesus descending to earth. How did Jesus do it? Jesus descended into the womb of Mary to incarnate. Therefore, it could be that the sons of God entered into the wombs of women in a similar way to incarnate, via a form of virgin conception. An artificial insemination is another method. Think of what happens in alien abduction stories. The difference between Jesus and the sons of God is that the sons of God fell like lightning and fire from heaven, and therefore were not authorized to perform such a thing. 
This brings us to the concept of salt, sulfur and mercury. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 1926. One of the strangest things to happen to someone in the Bible was when Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. There are many theories as to the meaning of this that can be found with a typical internet search. For this presentation, we will offer something from the occult. The concept of salt, sulfur and mercury is standard in occult alchemy. Although interpretations vary, the one that fits scripture would be that the salt correlates to the mother or daughters of men. The sulfur correlates with the father or fallen sons of God. The mercury corresponds to the child or the hybrid giants. In the case of Lot's wife, she represents salt and the daughters of men. The sulfur that rained down would represent the fallen sons of God. The city represents the strange flesh that the inhabitants sought after. It could be that this alchemical formula originated from the Bible and was kept as a mystery to avoid prosecution and that the whole land thereof is brimstone, and salt, and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom, and Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger, and in his wrath. Deuteronomy 29:23. Here again we see salt and sulfur being referenced to Sodom and Gomorrah, where the angels left their first estate, and where the people sought after strange flesh. The four horses of the Apocalypse share this same formula as well. The white horse represents salt and the daughters of men. The red horse represents sulfur and the fallen sons of God. The black horse represents their union, the giants. The pale horse would represent vitriol, or the acid that dissolves the heavens and earth. Take a close look at this alchemical art. Notice the resemblance to three of the four horses? They are combined in a flask. They are even painted in order of appearance in the book of Revelation. What is the artist trying to tell us? The Masonic Chamber of Reflection uses the salt, sulfur, mercury symbols as well. According to Wikipedia, the chamber itself is symbolic of a cave, introducing the candidate to the alchemical element of earth but also represents a womb in which the candidate is developing before going through his symbolic rebirth. Sound familiar? Notice the rooster is symbolic of Mercury. The rooster is the son of the morning. Lucifer reborn. Can we find this symbol in scripture? You bet. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Isaiah 14 29. Scholars suggest the cockatrice was Sargon, and the fiery flying serpent was Sennacherib. These were cruel leaders that serve as examples of the Antichrist. It is of no surprise that we see the Freemasons depicting this theme in the Chamber of Reflection, as the initiate contemplates being born again. Just what are they trying to birth here? The clue is in the word fiery. The Strong's word for fiery is seraph. This word is sometimes translated as seraphim. Think of the fiery flying serpent that Moses placed on a pole that later became the rod of Asclepius. Again, a picture of RNA and DNA. From the looks of it, the Masonic initiate is expected to become a future antichrist. This leads us back to Top Hat and the stream of brimstone prepared for the king. Some scholars suggest that this verse is referring to the army of Sennacherib, the fiery flying serpent. Whoever this king was, we know that ultimately, they represent Satan, who fell like lightning to become reincarnated once again as another antichrist. Seraphim are often thought of as being related to lightning. Thus, we have a soul and spirit falling from heaven looking for a body to incarnate into. Keep in mind that seraphim can be used for good or evil. Take for example, the ministering seraphim in the temple of God. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Isaiah 6 2. These seraphim are closely related to the nitrogenous bases that make up the DNA of God. 
Think of the two witnesses as chromatids, the candlestick and the arch cherubim. Something worth mentioning here is that these seraphim have six wings. The candlestick has six branches. Is there a correlation here? You decide. The bottom line here is that the ministers of flaming fire are most likely seraphim. These seraphim represent RNA, DNA and spirit, minus a body. God's holy genetic engineering facility. The dunce is asking a really good question with regards to all this research. What is the point? In other words, why did God go through all the trouble encoding so much biology and science information into the Bible? Is it all just God randomly showing off how smart he is? How does any of this affect our salvation? To answer these questions, we must go to the later chapters of the book of Ezekiel and study its famous temple. In the visions of God brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. Ezekiel 42. Ezekiel is given yet another incredible vision. He is shown intimate details of a future temple for the Israelites. This was no ordinary temple. This was to be the mother of all temples, complete with miraculous healing streams and healing trees. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Ezekiel 47 12. These types of descriptions lend some to believe that this temple is either the same as the New Jerusalem temple in the book of Revelation, or perhaps a millennial temple. Neither are correct unfortunately. In fact, it is with great sorrow that we must report the sad news that Ezekiel's temple will never be built. Why is that? And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, shew them the form of the house, and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof. And write it in their sight, that they may keep the whole form thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and do them. Ezekiel 43:11. It was a conditional promise. The condition was that if the Israelites were to repent and be ashamed of all they did, God would help them build the final temple that would bring heaven on earth. Sin would be over. Life on earth would be healed. Peace would reign forever. Unfortunately, the Israelites did not repent, and thus the plans were scrapped, never to be realized. This is one of the greatest tragedies in history. The whole purpose of God showing the Israelites all these hints we have been studying was to prepare them for their ultimate role. The reason that the Israelites were God's chosen people was because they were chosen to be the ones to correct the corrupt genetics of all life on earth. This was the function they were being trained for so methodically for so many years. Ezekiel's supernatural temple was to be a type of holy genetic engineering facility in which God would work alongside the Israelites to heal and to upgrade and to eliminate death. The Israelites simply did not have the wherewithal to pull it off. Can we blame them? Even with today's technology, this is a very challenging subject to comprehend. And so, a new plan was proposed. A New Testament in which the blood of the Lamb would salvage life. Ezekiel's temple would be replaced with New Jerusalem. A new heavens and new earth would replace the one we currently reside in. And in the end, all will be made perfect. It was all an incredible lesson of how the love of God prospered, no matter how rebellious his creation became. Even to the point of God sending his own Son in the flesh to die for us. And in the end, we will all live happily forever after. Hallelujah. Thank you for taking the time to consider this information. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Please share this freely. God bless.